Good morning. We're here to convene the December 15th. I've been saying this every month now, but here we are at the end of the year. December 15th, Scott County Board of Commissioners meeting. Uh, please join me in the pledge. Let's convene it first. There we go. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. I love the digital domain, and we are once again full strength in person and online and socially distanced, and we masked in, masked out, and all that fun stuff. Uh, moving on to item number two, are there any amendments to the agenda? I did not see any amendments to the agenda, so we'll let that stand as distributed. Um, item number three, approve the minutes of the December 3rd, 2020 County Board meeting, which we had distributed to us. Are there any changes, additions, deletions? Mr. Chair, I'll move approval. We have a motion. We have a second. Any discussion on that? Otherwise, as been the custom, we will have J.J. Roll call us out on that vote. <clears throat> Commissioner wickman Brinke. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Ulrich. Aye. Thank you very much. Moving on to item number four. A recognition of interested citizens, a great opportunity for folks to come and address the board, uh, and we will listen with both ears. Um, I'm just going to, I don't see anybody that wants to do that. I'm just going to look out to the hallway and I'm not seeing any others, otherwise we will move on. No line, no, no line. Um, we're going to move on to item number five, consent agenda. These are items that will pass with one motion. There's a few of them today, so this might be, if you didn't get your coffee, this is a chance to kind of refill that cup. I better take a drink before we move on. All right, I will read through those items. Uh, 5.1, adopt resolution number 2020-214. Authorizing execution of attachment five to the 2017 master agreement with Cyber Advisors Inc. for the provision of professional technical services delivered by a system engineer. 5.2 Adopt resolution number 2020 215, authorizing execution of attachment seven to the 2017 master agreement with Loeffler Companies Inc. for a senior systems engineer to assist with technical projects and daily operations as required. 5.3, adopt resolution 2020-216, authorizing execution of amendment three to attachment seven to the 2017 master agreement with Robert Half International Inc. for provision of a temporary desktop support technician. 5.4, adopt resolution number 2020-217, fixing the 2021 per diem rate for county board appointed citizen members of advisory bodies serving Scott County, Minnesota. 5.5, Resolution number 2020-223, committing $2.7 million of general unassigned fund balance for purposes of community economic support in Scott County and response to the COVID-19 pandemic and transferring $1.2 million general unassigned fund balance to the building improvement program with the capital improvement fund for housing support. 5.6, adopt resolution number 2020-224, setting the annual salary rate for the elected position of county attorney for 2021 and rescinding resolution number 2019-184. 5.7, adopt resolution number 2020-225, setting the annual salary rate for the elected position of county sheriff for 2021 and rescinding resolution number 2019-185. 5.8, adopt resolution number 2020-226, establishing the 2021 compensation plan policy and procedure to include the county compensation grade schedule the general and merit increase matrix for non-bargaining and rescinding resolution number 2019-186. 5.9, adopt resolution number 2020-227, setting the annual salary rate for the Board of Commissioners for 2021 and rescinding resolution number 2019-189. 5.10, adopt resolution number 2020-231, authorizing the revocation of a portion of Shoreline Boulevard Northwest to the city of Prior Lake and execution of a quick claim deed conveying the segment to the city. 5.11, adopt resolution number 2020-232, authorizing submittal of comments to the Minnesota Department of Transportation on the Trunk Highway 13 corridor study and alternatives analysis in the city of Savage. 5.12, adopt resolution number 2020-233, 
approving the final 2021 budget and levy of $33,350 for the Scott County Vermilion River Watershed Special Taxing District. <coughs> 5.13, adopt resolution number 2020-235, certifying final approved appraisal of value for certain land acquisitions and authorizing acquisition by expedited quick take eminent domain proceedings for construction of a roundabout at County Highway 2 and County Highway 15 in Helena Township. 5.14, adopt resolution number 2020-237, certifying final approved appraisal of value for certain land acquisitions and authorizing acquisition by expedited quick take eminent domain proceedings for County Highway 83, located in the city of Shakopee. 5.15, resolution number 2020-238, authorizing the transfer of $1.6 million of funds from unassigned general fund balance to the Building Improvement Program within the Capital Improvement Fund and $700,000 from the Retiree Health Insurance Fund to the Building Improvement Program within the Capital Improvement Plan for Intensive Residential Treatment Services Facility Construction and Medical Examiner Facility Construction Expenses. 5.16, adopt resolution number 2020-241, approving Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act Special Revenue Fund to be authorized for the use to cover pandemic response costs incurred in the county operation budget from no earlier than March 1st, 2020 through November 30th, 2020. Uh, 5.17, approve the appointment and reappointment of citizens to advisory committees. 5.18, adopt resolution number 2020-221, approving the service agreement with Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative for the Families Moving Forward Southwest Program in the amount of $110,000 for services January 1, 2021 through December 31st, 2021. 5.19, adopt resolution number 2020-222, authorizing entering into grant contract number GRK181336 with the Minnesota Department of Human Services to accept funding for the Child and Teen Checkup Outreach Program for 2021 in the amount of $335,940. 5.20, adopt resolution number 2020-234, approving the 2021 through 2022 Aquatic Invasive Species Prevention Plan. 5.21, adopt resolution number 2020-236, <clears throat> authorizing entering into an agreement with SRF Consulting Group, Inc., for preliminary design services for Trunk Highway 169 overpass and frontage roads improvements in Sand Creek Township. 5.22, adopt resolution number 2020-239, approving renewal of the Southwest Metro Drug Task Force Joint Powers Agreement. 5.23, adopt 20, the 2021 Conservation Practice Financial Assistance Program Policy Manual through the Scott Soil and Water Conservation District. 5.24, adopt resolution 2020-240, uh, approving the Scott County Emergency Operations Plan for 2020 and rescinding resolution number 2016-205. We're getting there, we're getting there. Another page. 5.25, adopt resolution number 2020-218, adopting the amended employee conduct, code of conduct policy and rescinding resolution number 2018-185. 5.26, adopt resolution number 2020-229, adopting the employee relations policy and rescinding resolutions number 2001-032, 9301, 2019-186, 2019-156, 2019-1901, 2019-069, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9619-9619, 9
5.28, approve the request for a conditional use permit to conduct an agricultural tourism operation and a farm market, Mark and Jennifer Jensen applicants and property owners in section 23 of Sand Creek Township. 5.29, approve the renewal applications for a 3-2% malt liquor license for Oakdale Ridge in Belle Plaine Township, St. Patrick's Athletic Association in Cedar Lake Township, and St. Patrick's Church in Cedar Lake Township for 2021. 5.30, approve the request to extend the preliminary plot rights for the territory development sections 32 and 33 of Credit River Township zoned rural residential single family. Uh, 5.31, approve 2021 of the 2021 Comprehensive County Fee Schedule. 5.32, approve record of disbursements and approved claims. 5.33, approve payroll processing of personnel actions. 5.34, adopt resolution number 2020-228, approving the summary of performance evaluation and establishing the 2021 salary for County Administrator Leslie Vermillion and rescinding resolution number 2020 dash zero two seven. Those are the 34 items <laughs> on the consent agenda for December 15th. Um, after we've gone through there, are there any that you would like pulled for? Uh, I got a message from one of the other commissioners they didn't hear. Oh, they, so, we, so we read, so we redo that again, please. That makes sense. Sure. We want to make sure, you know, I'm just going to refer that person who shall rename nameless to the record. They're all online. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'd like to pull 5.27, please. <clears throat> All right. We have a request to pull 5.27, which we will do. Mr. Chair, I would make a motion to approve the other 33 items, less 5.27. All right. We have a motion. Second. We have a second to uh, as amended. And I'm just going to now, any comments on that before we move forward? On that vote, I, I'm going to make a couple comments on 5.13 and 5.14. I'm not going to pull those because I've had conversations directly um, uh, before this meeting, so I'm going to leave those stand because it's kind of a bugaboo for me. But um, thank you for the conversation, staff. So, motion, second, any further discussion on these as amended, pulling 5.27? Otherwise, JJ, I'll look to a vote for those 33 items. Commissioner Welcome to Brecky? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? That's, that's, we're going to go, I know that makes it hard. That's, that's for you, Commissioner Beard. Mike. He's froze. His screen looks frozen. Yeah, it's, that's a good, that's a good pose he's froze on, though. <laughs> Could be worse. <laughs> so uh, let's, can uh, we have him, uh, there, oh, there he is, I think. Commissioner Beard? Let's go through and we'll see if he joins in, I'm sure. Commissioner will... Beer? Aye. Commissioner Ulrich? Aye. So I think he's trying. Aye. There you go, there we go. Nice, yep, without the video that, that came through. So um, so those items pass. Now I see Kate in the corner. So um, is that your stage name, Kate in the corner? Hello. Um, come on up and and uh, Commissioner Weckman Brecky, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, thank you, thank you. Um, so the, oh, you got you got your green. Oh, Forget we got the green. Go. Just Thank so you. Can hear Thank you. you for the reminder. Um, so 5.27 has to do with the letter that uh, is written on our behalf about <clears throat> mixed municipal solid waste. We did have a workshop on this uh, about a month ago, and and discussed uh, the issue. Um, I know I, I raised some concerns at that workshop, and and Leslie even brought up should we be having a meeting with the township prior to the letter and. And I said, no, um, now that I've seen the letter, I'm, a, I'm a just, I have a, some more concerns because the concerns that I raised at the workshop had to do with, um, I, I think we were clear that we're not committing to anything. We don't wanna commit to anything, but the letter makes it sound a little bit like we're committing to things. So I had some conversations with Kate about um, what, what the role of this letter is and I think Kate will um, be able to talk about it a little bit more and provide some suggestions if the rest of the board is willing. Sounds good. Uh, yes, good morning, Mr. Chairman. I know, it's a new good morning. day. It's a new day in Scott County. <laughs> we got to go green. Uh, Kate's at Logic Environmental Services. 
Uh, so Commissioner uh, Bre uh, Weckman Brecky's concerns are fair, and um, I understand them. And staff from uh, other counties in the state have had this conversation about um, how to lay this letter out so that it doesn't look like we are um, setting the stage to approve permits that even haven't um, been submitted yet. So. Um, I think that we can modify this letter to address that concern and still get the information that the MPCA is requesting. Um, if, you, if you have the letter in front of you, um, I'll just quickly, it only take me a moment and then those listening to the board meeting can also follow along. So the layout of the letter, it starts with um, Scott County's preferred method to manage the waste, which says we want to divert landfilling and increase recycling. Um, MSW waste should go to permitted landfills. Um, that's to protect the environment, so we know it's being uh, managed correctly. Then, um, it, in the second paragraph, it says, um, last sentence, in addition, the county prefers to manage MSW from Scott County in the most economical, feasible manner while disposing the waste locally and within Scott County, if possible. And my suggestion is that we maybe modify that last sentence um, since that possible makes it sound like this is a maybe, maybe not. Um, I would just take off um, the last part, disposing the waste locally in Wiscott County and leave it as, in addition, the county prefers to manage MSW from Scott County in the most economically feasible manner. So it kind of sets the stage. First, we protect the environment. Then we're financially responsible when it comes to managing this waste. Um, then next in the letter, it goes into how much we anticipate to generate um, over the next 10 years. And then in the last paragraphs, it goes over how we, much we determined each landfill should get. So Pine Bend, <clears throat> excuse me, and Burnsville landfill, we used historical data. We feel pretty comfortable with that. And then with DEMCON, I just want to note what it says, and I apologize, I thought I had it highlighted. And I think we need to leave this in there, but I just wanna highlight what it says for clarity. It says, we estimated that DEMCON companies, if permitted, would receive in the future a similar amount that they uh, receive for transfer station. Um, and the key there is if permitted, and we didn't want, so we don't want anyone to think that um, this is a, a approval of something that hasn't come in yet. They would still, any, any um, landfill that isn't an MSW, that wants to be an MSW, has to go through the state permitting process first. It's not an easy process, but you can get through it. Um, and then you would go to county and then either township or city, okay? So um, that's the, the key part that is in there if permitted, and we would want to leave that in there because one, it tells um, the MPCA should DEMCON ever get permitted, maybe, maybe not. This is what we would expect what would happen, so it gives them some direction. Um, and yet it, it lets everybody know that this is a, a, a situation that they'd have to get their permit first. Um, then when it comes to the resolution, that to, we wrote the resolution not to include where we would um, allocate the waste to because we felt like the resolution shouldn't get that into the weeds on where it should go. The resolution in this case should stay a high policy level on how we think we should manage the waste. And again, I would probably keep it as it is except for remove in the fourth paragraph where it says, in addition, the county prefers to manage MSW from local counties in the most economical feasible manner. I keep that, but I would remove while disposing the waste locally in Wiscott County if possible. If that mm -hmm. addresses concerns, I think that's an easy modification that we can make and then bring this back to board. Mr. Chair, I'll just say that I I know, I know. Thank you. I probably need that reminder for the next year. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Um, I did receive some concerns from Louisville Co Township. I, I understand, and I don't mean my concerns or the bringing this up to, on consent agenda, any ill will at all towards one of, uh, one of our county's great businesses, a great homegrown family business, 
DEMCON who does good work and partners with us all the time. I just think with um, such a long-term important decision, we shouldn't come off as looking like we've already agreed to permitting or agreeing to things that haven't come before us. So I really appreciate the conversation, Kate. I appreciate your ideas on um, making the letter a little bit more general, what's needed for this point in the process. And I think that we've seen through history some, you know, a long history of that landfill, then the ceiling of the landfill, all the things that went around it, and reopening it for this kind of use is a whole nother conversation and a longer conversation. So with that, and to allow my colleagues to um, comment, I would actually, I'm wondering, could we adopt the resolution with the amendments that Kate just uh, re, you know, went over? That's My motion would be to adopt resolution number 2020-242 with the amendments to the letter and the resolution that Kate very well just, just articulated. So that would be my motion. And I would second that. Um, so I guess that we can comment on that. And I'm just going to follow in with the comment. I think it's an important, and I'm glad you did that because sometimes we think that you know we we kind of have more of that information that we know that wasn't this wasn't like a rubber stamp like we're permitting this. We want this. It was a hey we th we know that this needs to happen. Um, so I think it's important that we do take that time to to specify that this is not a green light. Let's go. This is uh, approved. Because I believe, I, I forget when we had that workshop in the last month or whatever it was, and we happened to have, I don't know if it was later that day or, or that week, an intergovernmental working group, which obviously we know is uh, meetings with the tribe. I said, hey, we put this on the agenda because I want to talk about this because they've got their organics facility. They're looking at a place over by DEMCON, likely um, have conversations with DEMCON. So part of that messaging was this is just, it's a certificate of need, but we're not saying you just wanted to be clear, like what you're trying to do is that we're, this is not a, it's happening. Um, but the conversations are happening and definitely need to happen on this. So it's not, yeah, I think it's important that we make that amendment then. Anything else from, um, any other comments on Mr. adopting? Chairman. Yeah, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, good, it's coming through now. Hey, um, uh, did I just understand Kate to say she would make this modification and bring it, bring it back to us at the next board meeting for adoption? Because uh, it sounds like the motion is to incorporate it right now and adopt it right now. And I'm, uh, I'm sitting here uh, not knowing, uh, not seeing a copy of it, I guess. Although I, I kind of appreciated where Kate was going with the discussion. Uh, just clarify for me what it is we're considering at the moment. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Chair, my motion was because the um, amendments to the letter and resolution were were quite limited, and Kate explained them. My motion was to just approve it as amended, um, and I'm not sure. Kate, could you remind us of the deadline for this letter? Uh, yes, the um, the landfills need to get their application packet into the state by January um, 19th. So it's, it's mid-January, I think it's either the 18th or the 19th. Mr. Chair, there, therefore, if I, I, I think if Commissioner Beard feels strongly that he'd like to see the actual revisions to the letter before we approve it, I'm fine with um, friendly amendment to my motion. Uh, but like I said, it was really just a, a very small change. So my motion was to approve the resolution and send the letter with those amendments. Okay. Um, trusting the judgment of the call, my colleagues that are there and actually uh, uh, participated in that um, or heard it better than I heard it from afar, um, I'll go ahead and support the motion. To, uh, but then, Kate, would you send us a copy of uh, the letter that we're, uh, the amended version that we're going to vote on here tonight? Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Beard, I will do that. Thank you. All right, so we have a motion and a second to uh, adopt resolution number 2020-242 as amended to, to make it more clear that it is not a rubber stamp, um, but conversations are happening only. And you've got the language between you two can get that. Um, and we've got it on public record here as well. So um, with that, yeah, JJ. 
Roll call us on that item, please. Commissioner Wick Mabrecki? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Beer? Aye. Commissioner Ulrich? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. Now we're going to move on to the, the fun stuff. Um, I mean, it's all fun, of course, right? It's all fun. 6.1, we're going to recognize, well, we got a couple items here. We're going to recognize some retirees. So who gets to come to the podium first? The fun stuff. Hi, I'm Lori Reller, and I had the honor of supervising Kay DeCrite for 16 years while she's been here at Scott County. So I'd like to just say a few things about Kay. Uh, Kay was hired in 2006 to work at Scott County as a case manager in the adult mental health unit. Prior to coming to Scott County, Kay was a seasoned licensed social worker working in the past with homeless outreach and targeted case management. And we were so happy when she joined our team. She has done an exceptional job working with the clients we serve with a mental illness, providing targeted case management services to them. She cares about the clients she served and was committed in helping them live independently in the community. Kay helped clients connect with community resources they needed, such as therapy, psychiatry, or day treatment. She encouraged her clients as their mental health improved to pursue entering or re-entering the workforce or continuing their education. Kay connected clients with medical, dental services, health services. She developed a great working relationship with so many clients over the years. Clients that returned to our services often requested to work with Kay again. Kay saw the need for our unit to develop a more specific assessment or intake process and took this task on. Uh, when she did interviews, she gathered information, intake paperwork that we needed to qualify clients for our service. She also saw that some clients didn't fit our services but needed some direction on where to go for help. And she began referring clients and their family onto the correct service, what they needed instead of case management. Kay has served on many committees over the years, most notably the planning committee to develop the FISH network and the committee to decriminalize mental health in the jail. Kay has a wonderful working relationship with the adult mental health unit as well as many other units here at Scott County. And I have some comments that some of her peers has made that I'd like to read. I have always admired Kay's ability to get people to open up and talk to her. She has an extraordinary ability to do this. I have watched her over the years, and I believe it's her calm and caring demeanor that allows people to drop their walls and open up. Kay is also a friend and a coworker, and you can rely on her to be honest while being engaging. She is one of a kind. Kay has all, um, another worker said, Kay has been an outstanding coworker and a friend, always willing to help out and mentor. She will be extremely missed, and I'm excited for her new adventures. And one other peer comment I got was, Kay has been such a great mentor to those of us who came new to case management. She has been a valuable asset to our team, and her leadership and friendship will be missed. Well, Kay is retiring and is planning to relocate to Alabama where her husband's new job is located. Uh, she deserves some well-earned uh, break and time off, and now she'll have time to pursue her crafts and spend more time with her husband, her children, and three adorable grandchildren. Thank you so much, Kay. Thank got to go green. You can't get away without, uh, you know, normally it's like a 15, 20 minute speech. Uh, you know, it can be, it can be shorter. Yeah. And, yeah. Leslie's yeah. giving you the, hey, you know, come on up. Yeah. Oh, boy. she's saying it's kind of up to you. But okay. Come, okay. Come, come. I wasn't, I wasn't prepared for a speech, but um, I will, can I take this down for a second? Yeah. It's just hard to talk through it. It is. Um, I will say I've just really enjoyed my time at Scott County. Um, I've met Great coworkers, team members, uh, Scott County employees. It's it's been a fun job, um, but you know, really, I've it's I've met so many awesome citizens, um, and oh, gosh, I didn't think I was going to get emotional. Mm -hmm. um, and it, hmm. 
uh, it's felt like an, a real honor to work with them. Um, and uh, I wish I had water or something. Um, but I've really been. Oh, look well, look at this! Look at I'm getting That's served. Retiring service, room. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You know, they say if you're going to cry, you should swallow some water. So oh. I guess I'll do that. Um, um, but you know, I've really been impressed, um, especially over the last you know ten years or so, how um, as a county and as a board, that you've really taken on adult mental health or mental health in general in the county, and really, um, I've really watched the services grow. Um, for the clients that, that we serve, as well as you know, children's mental health, um, chemical dependency, just a lot of those areas that affect the clients that I've been dealing with for 20 plus years. Um, so I really, that's been really satisfying. Um, I can do the work I do and I feel like it's valuable, but it's just uh, can't possibly impact our community without your support. So um, that's just been really fun to see real measurable improvements in our, in our county and in our community for people with mental health issues. So I really do uh, thank you for that, and I hope that that awareness and support continues for our folks. Uh, it's just, it's, I've been an honor, a privilege. Um, I enjoy my coworkers, I enjoy my teammate, teammates, but um, I really feel satisfied with the help I've been able to give to my clients. Mm -hmm. um, in the time I've been here, and then my other case management responsibilities as well. So thank you. And I will miss working at Scott County, but I'm also looking forward to my next chapter. Mm, thank you, that. you guys. Thank you. <laughs> now, is she aware that if you move to a warmer climate in Minnesota, you can't do it until spring? You can't, <laughs> isn't that part of the? I don't know if that's written in. Yeah. Is there anybody online who wanted to comment um, before Kaylee's here? I just wanted to reach out and ask. Good idea. Yep, if Leslie, I hi, this is Pam. Oh, go no, go ahead, Danielle. I'll go after you. Go right ahead. You know, I was just going to comment. Um, Kay has just been a, a fantastic staff to our adult mental health unit, and she speaks. She spoke to the measurable outcomes that she's seen over the last several years. But Kay really herself had a major impact on those measurable outcomes, and really is a prime example of our county vision of residents are connected to the community and people have access to quality services and supports. Kay worked in adult mental health case management, but she had a huge role in mental health intake. And so she was the first face people saw, the first voice they heard. Um, you know, this is a voluntary service that people are coming to get support, but people are oftentimes frustrated or nervous or confused, scared, or even angry. Um, it's a hard system to navigate. And Kay really, I think, helped shepherd people through and she engaged them and made them feel welcome. Um, but she also took it a, a step further. Kay looked at our data and helped us really improve services overall. You might recall in a 2019 Scott County Delivers presentation, we were talking about how many people um, look for services in adult mental health and only about, at that time, only about 50% of people would actually have services that came to our door. Um, it also took about 60 days for us to get people into case management. Kay was the one who really brought that data forward around that 50% of engagement. She took it again a step, a step further and looked at why people weren't connecting to us and helped us sort of troubleshoot and um, find better ways to do this service. So I think she really deserves a lot of credit for the changes that have been made. She's been able to take advantage of so many opportunities um, for clients seeking services and for the unit overall, even with um, COVID-19, Kay jumped right in and tried to find different ways to engage people and actually found that by eliminating a barrier of having people come in person, we were able to connect them easier to services. So I, I just wanted to speak to, to Kay and her impact historically over the course of our her time with our unit. But I think also moving forward, her her recommendations, the data that she's brought forward, I think will really change a lot for people um, who seek our services in the future. So I just wish her well and 
hope she doesn't disappear in her entirely come back with us and, and share your wisdom with our staff and continue to help us build services for our clients. But thank you, Kay, and, and, and congratulations again. Thanks, <clears throat> excuse me, thanks Danielle. Um, I couldn't let Kate leave without just saying a couple words. Um, I have always, always enjoyed my conversations with Kay. Um, when I think about her, um, what comes to mind is she is someone that exudes compassion. When Lori talked about um, clients wanting to come back with to her and wanting to see her, that, 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 that is Kay. That is Kay um, across the board. I have no doubt all of the folks she met with, she engaged with, and they felt a connection to her. And that is really what um, can be meaningful to clients and move this, help them move work forward is that connection is that compassion that she showed. I have thoroughly enjoyed um, my conversations with her. Um, she is um, someone that so clearly cared about her work, cared about her clients. Um, the, this was not easy work that she had, often challenging, challenging situations with sometimes people at some of their worst, but she brought um, compassion and hope to them in her work here. I will, I am a bit envious um, and do just wish Kay well as she has an opportunity to um, go on some new adventures and spend time with those little grandchildren. Thanks, Kay. So I just want to add one thing. Um, Kay worked in a division that I obviously didn't directly supervise or work with um, over the years, but I've been involved with these DWM small group meetings or with team meetings over the years. And there are certain people that just pop into mind and the name comes because they have been so positive and in those meetings offered input or suggestions that again, come across in a positive way to try to improve the entire organization. And I would say the entire mental health team and the mental health center, the things that come across from like what Kay just mentioned was the need for access within the community. And not that the county needed to do it itself, but we needed access to nonprofits and other types of tools for these people. And that would come across and some of the things that you've seen the county focus on and do over the last couple of years are direct results of some of those types of comments and understanding that come through and work their way up. And so I just want to say thank you for that positivity, for the use of understanding, seeing things, and trying to make us a better organization um, through those tools, and want to wish you the best moving forward in your new life, and your kids, and your grandkids, and certainly enjoy. So thank you for all you've done for us in that positive, we can do this, positive suggestions that you've brought forward to this organization. Thank you. And you need to stay here. You can't leave quite yet. <laughs> yeah, and bef bef yeah, I'm sorry I interrupted there. Um, before, before the hardware, I just have to say, I'm really glad to hear that you've got grandkids because I don't know how you're going to walk away from doing this job. <laughs> because, I mean, what I just heard here is that sounds a lot like a life well lived that you've been planting seeds in people's lives that will be a legacy that will last generations. Um, I'm getting goosebumps. I might need my water here pretty soon. Um, like that's a really big deal. Um, that's a really big deal. So thanks for investing in other people's lives and helping other people out. And so now those grandkids can take your time because that's, that's impressive. It's really impressive. Hey, now the hardware. I was just going to say on a personal note, I had the privilege of being one of the people who had interviewed Kay, and uh, she was phenomenal then. She continued to be, and she has become a dear friend to all of us. Um, we are going to miss her incredibly. She's irreplaceable. Thank you, honey. <laughs>
Are we doing the scan so we can? That'll help. Should we look at the camera or wait? How was that exciting? Thanks. Thank you. See, we left that plaque, you know, um, you. a little open on the side so you can kind of craft it and, you know, oh, yeah. do your little little <laughs> trinkets and bedazzle it, whatever, whatever happens. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yep, we're, so we're, now we're going to item, see, we're still in the fun stuff. You know, Danny's going to change change for us, but we're still at a 6.2. <laughs> Uh, where here comes Jake coming to the podium for another a retiree uh, honoree. So Jake, take it away. Good morning. Oh yeah, we see. Yeah, yeah, and that one doesn't extend eight feet, but the, we'll, we'll, hopefully it'll pick it up. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Commissioners. We are here to honor Bob Peckfors. Last year, Scott County Library celebrated its 50th anniversary. During that time, we reflected on the library's legacy. What makes a library a library? What makes it a special place? The answer, of course, is the people. It's been said that a room full of books is simply a closet, but an empty space with a librarian in it is a library. We wouldn't be what we are without our dedicated staff. And now we're celebrating the legacy of our longest serving and one of our most dedicated librarians Shockley Library Branch Manager, Barb Hegfors. After 43 years of service, Barb will retire at the end of the month. She started at the Savage Library in 1977. I remember it well. Uh -oh. <laughs> and the library used a microfiche catalog and lent items like eight millimeter film. Nice. After working at Savage and Shockley for several years, she moved permanently to Shockley in 1983 and became the manager in 1989. She guided the Shakopee Library through numerous changes, including a building move in 2003 and the installation of the Smart Play Spot in the children's area. The Shakopee Library has been a welcoming oasis for families and individuals thanks to Barb's leadership. As a librarian, Barb has touched many lives. She has built lasting relationships with school and community groups, serving on the Community Education Board for several years. Staff, volunteers, and community members frequently reminisce on the growth opportunities she's provided them. She's beloved by library regulars who frequently stop in to chat with her or seek her assistance. Notably, her genealogy expertise has connected many customers to meaningful information about their family trees. I'll, add, I'll go off the script here for a second and add that every Friday I get a call from a Shakopee Library, every Friday, I get a call from a Shakopee Library user um, thanking Barb and her team for her service. And it's, it's always brief, you know, 30, 60 seconds, uh, but it just, it means the world to him, the, the work that she and her team do over there. Barb embodies the true spirit of Scott County. She is graceful, resilient, and kind. Over the past 43 years, she has provided excellent service no matter how difficult the circumstances, and she's, we've had some difficult circumstances for the last nine months and the last couple of weeks. Her legacy will live on at Shakopee and throughout the Scott County Library System. We are so very proud of Barb and we wish her the best. Thank you. <laughs> 15 to 20 minutes, right? The speech? No. I, no. <laughs> um, I, I wasn't going to be here and uh, Leslie Sweet talked me into <laughs> coming. She's good at that. I, I, I told Jake, I said, it's hard to say no to her. He knows that better than I do, but anyways, um, thank you, commissioners. Um, where's the time gone? It's 43 years and four months and a few days to be exact. <laughs> if, you're, if you're counting. Yeah, if I'm counting. Um, it's flowing by. Uh, it's going to be the biggest adjustment I've ever made leaving here. Um, staff has been wonderful over the years. Um, my staff and the whole county library staff uh, lots of changes, of course, as Jake mentioned, and um, the people, you know, I've seen them as youngsters coming in, and now they're coming in with their own kids or grandkids, and no, I don't have any grandkids of my own. I'm, hopefully that will change one day, 
I still want to be fairly young when that takes place. Um, but um, I want to th thank everybody for your support. And um, I may, I plan on volunteering, so maybe you'll see me in amongst the shelves someday very <laughs> soon. <laughs> Hopefully that can change so that I can come back uh, sooner than later. Um, need some time, take some time off, hopefully next year to travel a little bit once COVID is under control and spend time with my grown kids. Um, my daughter's having some surgery next week and so I think it's sort of a time, a natural time. Things aren't quite the same at the library under these circumstances and who knows when that'll change back to what it was before. But don't want to get too emotional. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, we only have so much water here, so. <laughs> <laughs> Kleenex. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know that thing you talked about, the microfiche and stuff, and I remember going and looking at it, and I think oh. one of those things oh. that my kids will never, you know, appreciate is yeah. trying to find something Oh, like the that. best. And you put it on the screen, it's, right. you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> I don't miss that. I don't, just no. just look at your little, the online and. So, uh, good morning, commissioners. Um, I, I did call Barb last week. I, today's supposed to be kind of a happy day, right? Lots of good things to celebrate. And um, at 43 years, she's our longest tenured employee, and, and she needs to be in front of the board and everything she has accomplished and the change from the library system, surviving Janet Williams, Vanessa, and then Jake. I mean, that's a big, that's, big, big thing, you know? And war the stories whole, right there. That Shakopee Library um, was a tight-knit team of folks there that went through a um, pretty traumatic event last week. Mm -hmm. And her leadership and bringing those folks together to talk, um, just talking with a couple of the other staff, knowing Barb was there, was really important to them as well. Um, I just, you know, and Jake, he's such a smart aleck. You know, when we would talk as a library management team, especially a couple of years ago before a couple of them retired, they'd say something like 1970. I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> I mean, thanks, Jake. Um, you know, I was graduating from high school. So, um, but there's a couple stories I want to tell. Um, one, every once in a while, I would go out a couple times and, and struggling with a decision or um, would walk to the library. And um, I would just go out and go for a walk. You know, we're encouraged, get up, thinking, walking. And, you know, um, it had to do with replacing Vanessa when she left. And you know me, I'm an outcome person. And we had two committees that met, and we reviewed these apps. And they all wanted this traditional librarian, traditional librarian. And I thought Jake was our best candidate. And for once, it was my gut that was like, Jake's the best candidate. So I went for a walk down to the library, and there was Barb, always up at that reference desk. And I just, she goes, something's troubling you. And I said, yeah. You know, they were in my division, and, and I had to make this decision. And she looked at me, and she said, well, what is it? And I just said, well, I'm really stuck. I think I should offer it to Jake. But the rest of you guys are all saying, this librarian. And she goes, your gut is right. Do what your gut said. So the reason... One of the reasons Jake is here today was because of Barb Hegford. <laughs> and being able to walk down there and get some solid advice that said, go with your gut. It was usually Gary that went with his gut, and I was the data person. But that day, I think I made the right decision, and I will always thank her for just making me see it right. The other one was, at one point in our careers here, oh, JJ, where's my... Oh, yeah. Um, I got it here. I'm okay now. Um, at one point, the library team, management team, as part of CS, we were doing some management discussions, and Jake, I think, had just come here at this point. Um, and Pam Johnson and I had been meeting about um, management and good decisions and poor decisions, and so we decided to study Star Wars. And we had the Darth Vader micromanagement, right? And then you had the rebellion with this planning, and you had the small guy versus the big guy, and that this small group of people, no matter how small, could make a difference and impact with one shot, right? And so we had these discussions. But I just want to show you Barb Hegfer's right here in this picture. Look at her. Don't you think she makes an awesome, awesome Star Wars with her uh, lightsaber there? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
So anyway, I thought that was a fun picture of uh, Barb in our management. If you can imagine Pam Johnson over here as Darth Vader, uh, it's kind of hard to imagine. But when you take a look at this team, one, two, three of them have now retired from our library system. And what a great, great group of managers that moved us forward and, and brought us in. If there's one thing I've learned from studying the libraries, um, it is that in times of crisis and need, they are really important to our community. And people go there, they need access to those computers, they need access to those books, they need access to our staff. <laughs> and just our staff being for them, being there for them, is so important. And so I want to thank Barb for that relationship she had with the Shakopee community, the relationship with our staff, and the difference she's made in 43 years to um, Scott County. So thank you. <laughs> I know that building in, uh, you know, I mean, Shakopee, the library in Shakopee in general has become a much more than a building with books. It's been become a bit of a refuge over the years for folks. Um, and that does, doesn't happen by happenstance. Um, it's a much bigger, it's more than just learning the Dewey Decimal System. Does that thing still exist? Yes. Does that, that still exists? Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm working on still working on that. Um, so, yeah, thanks for making it more than just books. It's, it's so much more than that. And that comes from people. That comes from hearts. That comes from people like you. So thank you for being that leader in that, in that space and time for 43 years. Yeah. Mr. Chair? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to say a couple words to Barb and, and to Kay, too. Um, my kids really grew up at the Shakopee Library, you know, and, and now they're, I don't know how old they are, 21. They're in their 20s. Um, but they really grew up there and, and have so many memories of the Shakopee Library. But one of the things that I just want to thank Barb for again, because I know she always believed this was important too. Each summer, except this summer, um, Barb and her team and, and all our libraries worked with preteens and worked with preteens and gave them a job. It was a volunteer job to work with the summer program. But that's where so many young people learn their first skills of showing up on time. She made it very important and it was, it was <clears throat> taught they had to be on time, how they treated their customers and, and their responsibilities. And what a huge learning experience. So mm -hmm. yes, the library is so much more than books. That's just one small thing. But that small thing impacted so many young people in our county and started teaching them those skills. So when I think back to all my, my library connections, I, that's one that I just appreciate so much because it changed life. So much of what Barb does and did and, and Kay does and did, it changes lives. You, your job is truly life-changing, and then we're here today, too, that you didn't just change individuals' lives, you changed this organization and, and changed how it's going to look in the future. It's, it's amazing, and C Commissioner Beer said it well, wow, life well lived. Um, and you got lots more to do, it just might be in some different, different venues. So thank you very much. Thank you for changing lives and, and making Scott County a better place to live. Is there a picture of this one? You do, yes, or, I got to get a picture. Got to get a picture. How does Danielle get that clapping hand on the screen? I think she got it before or something. I asked the same question. I think we're going to take a, a brief recess and individually file into the next room, in and out of the next room, to keep everyone socially distanced. So we're going to be in a brief recess. And I can hear you. All right, we are back from a brief recess for some retirees. And I got to tell you, yeah, I've got a weak connection here, and it, if I turn the video off, I use less bandwidth. Let's and do my that. Audio actually sounds better. Can you can you hear us okay, Commissioner Beard?
Where's he at? I'm not sure. Yeah, so, all right. He, yes. There you go. Do you have a couple comments before on, because I know we had some uh, yes, I can difficulties. Hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. I know you wanted to make a couple comments on, I believe it was 5.15 back on the consent agenda. So take it away if you can hear me okay. Yeah, uh, Emma. Now I can't hear you. Consent agenda. Yeah, it was just an enlightening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, the only comment I was making was, or one to make on 5.15 was, it looked uh, to the uninitiated like we were taking money from our our retirees, and that was absolutely not the case. Um, the retiree fund is fully funded. This is surplus uh, cash that we're moving over to the building fund. That's all I wanted to say. I just want to make that clear. Yep, that's a good point. Uh, that's a good point because we all know that reading it, but um, just to expand there on that know. to the public is helpful. Yeah, Commissioner Beard, that's a great point that really this is a very really big positive from right. staff over the years making that contribution um, to this trust that was in a positive light to make sure that it was paid off and we didn't have those ongoing obligations and that it was paid off early in 2020, even prior to when we had thought it would be, allowed us to make some of these capital investments, which help our operating fund moving forward. So you are exactly right. It is a positive for the entire community. Yeah, we need to be uh, more bold to, to tell the good stories. Um, I know in, in Minnesota, no one likes to brag about themselves, but it's important for people to know. Um, so yes, we're coming back from recess from retirees and I just wanted to say it is so joyful when you see a round peg find a round hole for so long. Um, round peg in a square hole, you can make it fit, but boy, it's not pretty. Um, two lives well lived. Um, so now we're going to start back up with 6.3, looking to adopt resolution number 2020-219, setting the Scott County and Minnesota gross levy for taxes payable in the year 2021 in the amount of $78,500,211 less $5,962,211 certified property tax aids for a net levy of $72,538,000. Leslie, take it away. Mr. Chairman, um, I'm going to present the capital improvement program and then tag team it with Danny Lenz, the CFO, who's going to come up and um, present the budget. And instead of doing multiple presentations over these next couple items, we're just going to make these couple here right up front. So and let the record show you just told me that about 60 seconds ago and I already forgot. So <laughs> perfect. Take it away. All right. So this is another one that um, I'm really upbeat about because even through this pandemic, there has been a lot of really good things that have happened in Scott County and for this community. Things that have been underway for the past several years that came to completion this year. And I really am kind of excited to share this with the public today. Um, the board has seen some of this, but um, the building going up next door to us, the uh, Government Center West, we began planning in this back in this 15, 16 timeframe, taking a look at um, our space needs. For example, out at the Central Shop, um, that building was constructed in 1985. Now it's there for all to see. Yeah. There you go. Sorry about that. Nope. Thanks, JJ. Um, back in 1985, they had outgrown space for equipment. We had people busting at the seams on the third floor and things stacked to the ceiling. We'd outgrown space at the Workforce Development Center and actually moved them into um, what was a conference room at one point. And so the need was here. We went through a process of looking at expanding multiple buildings and made the decision to bring everybody to this campus so that it was at one location, easier for the public, they would know where to go, we could have some consolidated counters and customer service areas. That design went through a process in 17 and 18, 
You had some really clear direction on bonding and fiscal direction that you gave us that we'll talk about in a moment, but currently um, is under construction. Um, we began construction in April of 19. It seems like it's been under construction longer than that next door to us here, but it actually began um, last year. Public Works, the warm storage building, was completed in this June and is actually being utilized now out at the Central Shop. The Government Center West, we're actually anticipating beginning to move people into that building in less than four months, in early to mid-March. The Justice Center and the Government Center East, the building you're in today, will go under renovation beginning um, next March of April of 2021. It'll take about nine to ten months. Um, but you will actually be rotating your board meetings at the different city councils then over the course of next year, um, beginning probably in that April time frame. And then the law enforcement center. You know, a lot of times capital should be based on actually improving your operating as well. In an evaluation of the bond hearing courtroom, we thought about expanding that for in-custody hearings. Um, the sheriff's office, the county attorney's office, the public defender, um, the judges, a court admin were all involved in this decision that there would be some operating costs. And ultimately, we decided to renovate um, the law enforcement center on the third floor and, and build out that courtroom, um, which for in custody now will make it a lot easier to move people back and forth. And then ultimately, it leads to a decision here to sell the workforce center. Um, and that happens to come in really good timing with our partner, um, the school, Southwest School District has an interest in selling as they're moving into some new space on the south side of 169 in Dean's Lake. And the CAP agency has some constraints there as well. And so we'll be looking at doing that during the 2021 year. You had some really specific goals for us so that when we talk to the public and what we're trying to accomplish in our staff, but it was really about retaining and attracting employees, right? We wanted an inviting work atmosphere and some flexibility. We wanted to bring these teams together. Um, when possible, we want to be out in the community, right? We have things like the Reed Mobile. We have staff that go out and meet with clients. We've applied for this um, Hubs grant where we could have three locations set up in the community through HHS jointly with some nonprofits that we're going to have to probably modify moving forward, but it's that concept of being out in the community. And then we had to plan for 2040. We really need this building to be able to evolve and meet the needs as the work world is changing. We really wanted to consolidate those counters, right? This is a, you're going to know where you go when you come in this building. There's only three public access points to it at Atwood 4th and 5th, and you come into an area where it's very clear and where you're going to move to. And then this delineation between public and private. We have now set it up so there are interview rooms um, for health and human services and for the folks on the government center east side, land records taxation, instead of people just wandering through this building. Yet I think when people see the atrium and how it's set up, it is going to be a warm and welcoming feeling for people coming into this with the mural and those types of things as well. So I think through the design and what we've done, um, we've been able to stay on budget. Um, we've been able to accomplish some of these high level goals. You also made it very clear you did not want to increase the levy for a capital investment. And so through coordination with a bond that was expiring in 2019 from the Justice Center and the Workforce Center, um, the post-employment benefits that were coming due in 2021 that actually came due in 2020 that we just talked about. And then we also had a transportation bond that was going to expire in 2027 that we could roll forward at a reduced rate. We were able to accomplish that. And we put out about a $68 million plus dollar bond for the construction of the four buildings you see here, as well as some work at the Marshall Road Transit Center and the Central Shop. Um, we were able to accomplish um, that goal as well. So let's celebrate a little bit. Here's, here's the central shop. Um, this is the warm storage building here that was just completed earlier this year. It allows for some storage. Um, previously, when staff would go to plow at 2 to 3 in the morning, they'd have to move, I can't remember if it was 10 to 12 vehicles out of the drive lane that we were keeping stored in there. Um, they're now able to pull in and out of here. The salt shed, of course, has existed since about 2005, but it makes that um, campus flow better. This is just another shot of the four um, entry points for the vehicles. There still is some outdoor storage over that overhang. 
Uh, moving to this building, this is an overhead of, of the whole complex. You can see the law enforcement center here. Um, this is parking lot H. That one was completed early on in this project. There were some additional stalls. There was some lighting provided there. That's one of the things we heard from our staff and that the clients gave to the staff that we needed more well-lit parking lots at night when people were leaving this time of year. Even though starting next Monday, every day is going to start to get a little brighter and longer. Yay. Um, we have developed, I think, a great partnership with the church. Um, we have reconstructed this parking lot. This one will be overlaid when they're done using it for staging. But we have staff parking there now, and um, we are coordinating with them and helping to maintain the lot, being able to use it. It's been a great partnership, I think, moving that forward. This is parking lot B. This one will be for public parking during the day, and then staff parking can certainly go there at night. But they will have access to a sidewalk then that will take them to a crosswalk here. And then parking lot A, where we just partnered, the city of um, Shakopee had a need for some water storage, right, in these tight urban areas. It gets to the Minnesota River too quickly. So they have some vault storage underneath that parking lot in a partnership project that we did with them. Um, this shows you the Government Center West. This is the Government Center East, the building that we are in today, and then the Justice Center. This will be the Fifth Avenue entrance off of this parking lot. Again, this will be public parking during the day. This is the Atwood entrance. You can see the loop here that is being constructed for a drop-off and some handicapped parking in this area. But Vet Services is located right here where we have a bus and we have a lot of drop-offs for our vets that come to this facility. Um, and then you see the tunnel that has been reconnected um, in this area. That decision to excavate the building from where there's no windows over to the west has really paid off in dividends as we were then able to move the holding cells um, for the Justice Center to this location, which eases up some space for the law library, court administration, and that high volume um, courtroom provides great access to the tunnel and then to the elevator through the Justice Center. Let's see, what have I missed? And then this is the Fourth Avenue entrance here into this link that connects the uh, campus. This is just kind of an aerial view now. Um, gives you a feel of where you will come in up the stairwell that you're gonna see here in a minute. This is the entrance off of Fifth. This will take you into kind of a reconfigured passport customer service area. Um, it'll be a lot easier for folks to navigate. There are some meeting rooms here now for tax and land records. Um, there'll be some public computers where people can access for deeds and titles and that type of research that they need to do. And eventually a conference room wing here and the anchor center um, will be relocated to this part of the building and then utilize the staff only entrance as it exists today. You can see then that you will still go through security into the justice center. This will be where community corrections is today, that high volume courtroom on the first floor. Um, the law library will be updated. So there's a lot of work that's going to go on in that remodel as well. And for folks who haven't been here for a while, this is what the Government Center West looks like. And one of the goals of this building was light and to get natural light into this building. Um, the offices are built to the interior. Um, and so the folks in the cubes will see that natural light coming through that eventually gets to those interior office and conference rooms. You can see here, this is the mental health center where there's still some pretty good sized windows and lights and how as we lose that coming to the west. And this is that area where you decided to excavate out underneath still, which has provided that additional storage. This is the fourth avenue entrance and this was that parking lot B here that has been renovated. This kind of shows you the, the line between them. Here's the skylights that provide that atrium and entranceway into the building. The justice center stayed intact. You'll see that wall here in a minute. This is the Atwood entrance. This has actually been paved today, um, but where people can drop off um, and enter then the facility. Just looking from the east back to the west, this is the Fifth Avenue entrance into the link that people are familiar with today. So this is the Fourth Avenue entrance. You can see the stairwell under construction. There's a set of stairs down um, for folks to the mental health center and to the UA testing area. There's also an elevator um, back to that side for people that can't navigate the stairs. Um, but this wall, that is a artist's rendition of what that is gonna look like. 
Um, and we had a group of staff and Commissioner Wolf who participated in this process. They reviewed some murals. Um, this door will actually also be painted as part of the mural. It just wasn't for this rendition. But this is a very generic a mural of Scott County's history over the past several hundred years. There's only one definable being in it, and it's Dan Patch. Here is that uh, old tree, right, the aging tree, the eagle that flies outside my window quite often, kind of a mid-level tree, mid-life tree, I should say, and then a young tree. The voyageurs who explored the Minnesota River um, we're working with the SMSC to make sure we get the right cultural context in it. We have the pioneers who settled here, agriculture. We have the river and the lakes, which are so important to our recreation and provide life for our community. We have the growing city skylines and the granaries and then the entertainment, right? Roller coaster and those types of things in the background. And so this is really representative of Scott County over the past several years. I think I missed the railroad, which was so critical to our development as well. But again, that stairwell up into the link and then down to the mental health center. I think it's something this community will be able to be proud of for a long time uh, moving forward. This is just looking back down so people that are in the link now, I'm standing back towards it. This direction would go into the government center east, so where customer service, passports, um, tax and assessing are. Back through this location, you will go into the justice center, you'll go through security, similar as you do today. And then this is the government center west, um, and I believe this is the elevator axis here coming up. I um, did want to highlight the two of the floors, the um, attorney's office and um, community corrections are both directly constructed into that link at the second and third floor for security purposes. Remember, um, no clients or non-staff are allowed back into staff work areas, but community corrections and the county attorney's office both have need for people to go through security that they need to then visit with. And so there's almost like a sally port here um, you can see the government center east here. This is looking towards the new building, and then I'd be standing back towards the Justice Center um, counters here for people. But this will allow people to come through security up to the third floor if you're in the county attorney going to see somebody, or the second floor, community corrections, and then there are visiting rooms um, or witness rooms that then are provided in those locations after they've gone through security um, to meet with our staff. So these two are actually connected right to the link. The other um, area that has access to the Justice Center is there is, a, there is a bridge on the third floor that allows our children's service area to also go back and forth to court for their needs. They're also located on the third floor with the county attorney because of the work that they jointly do at times as well. This is just one of the examples. Um, again, you can see the offices here to the interior. There's a little bit of color in this building um, other than beige. Uh, this is looking down that wall that you see in this first picture. You can see the windows that will allow light into where these areas where the cubes are. And the county attorney's office would be on the other side um, of that wall. I'm standing towards Atwood. This is just an example of the skylight and the size and then what it allows into the atrium. Um, I'm standing towards the east end of the atrium. You can see the Justice Center stays intact. Um, they covered a few windows during construction. Uh, this is the new building here. Very clearly delineated the Health and Human Service counter area. There'll be some flag signing that comes out for that as well as vet services delineated that same way and we'll have some flag signing. This is where the Atwood entrance is where people will come in um, and it's a very warm and welcoming feeling um, even more now than when these pictures were taken as you come down with the light um, and the colors in that building. So that's obviously a big part of what's gotten done this year, but we have had some other major capital investments um, come to play here in 2020 and 2021. You took action through a public hearing and um, 20, whatever, 2015, the, the action that you took today, or item 15, I guess it was, um, to transfer some money for the ERTS and the medical examiner. We have also had a Cleary Lake maintenance facility, um, which replaced an old farmhouse out there, which had been years in the making. And then the investment through CARES that um, broadened some fiber and broadband and then, of course, in transportation, a couple big, big projects that were completed this year. 
But here for the public is an example of the intensive residential treatment center. This had been one of the major mental health invest investments that the board, um, Dakota County, the state of Minnesota, the city of Savage and Guild has made over the last couple of years. It's a 16 bed facility with people that need intensive services. This is the uh, courtyard, the Janet Williams courtyard for all of her efforts through mental health through Scott County. Um, here's just an example of the interior of the building, uh, the small rooms that they have, gathering spot. And then, of course, the ribbon cutting, which, again, was a big celebration between all of the partners um, that I just named to bring this forward. This is the Clear Lake Maintenance Facility. If there's something I'm saying here, it is partnerships, right? You've heard it in the construction of this building a little bit. Um, the Earth certainly was, but Cleary Lake Maintenance Facility is a partnership between us and Three Rivers Parks. Um, this was a needed facility for them to be able to do just minor maintenance work, um, for their staff to be able to meet, to have a place to store things when they were out in the field. Um, but this is at Cleary Lake. It will serve um, all of these kind of southern parks here in Scott County. You can see the two big shop doors and then a couple, a smaller one right here for equipment. Um, and for them to be able to go inside and do some office work as well. There's a lunchroom and some meeting spaces up above and a couple offices over here on the far side of the facility that you can see right here. And that again made a good decision to start that, got good quotes last fall and that was completed earlier um, this year. Fiber broadband, um, this is just a map. The red kind of showed the existing fiber the yellow showed where, as part of your CARES allocation and partnerships with the uh, townships, um, where we extended fiber in different areas. You can see that, that where that infrastructure went in. And then the blue shows where some towers were constructed to expand the ability for distance learning for our youth, as well as for people that need to work from home or have home-based businesses. Um, you can see that it was quite an expansion to our system to reach out into those rural areas. I know that um, Perry and Cindy, I believe, are coming back sometime in 2015 with more, 2015, 2021 with more specific information on people who have, how many have signed up and who is utilizing the service in the coverage areas that we have now. And then the other major partnership that we have is with Hennepin County and Dakota County. Hennepin has provided us from everything I gather um, for the past years, excellent medical examiner services. Um, we continue to partner with them. We entered into um, a cooperative agreement to fund our portion of the use of this building. Um, that again is gonna be paid off early um, based on the uh, OPEBs being paid off early. But this was the last picture I had in December that showed this building being constructed. It actually will be far closer for any of our local staff or Dakota staff that have to go there. It's located over off of County Highway 62 and 494 in, in that vicinity. So it will be much closer for any of our staff or police departments that have to access from Scott County. It is to be completed and operational, I believe, by October of 2021, I think is the latest update that I had um, from Hennepin County. So moving into transportation, as we celebrate some other big ones, 169, right? We have been at this since uh, like 2002, it goes back, this march forward to improve safety, mobility, and economic development along this corridor from 494 all the way down to Trunk Highway 19 at the edge of our southern county. Um, and both the 41 and 14 play into that. County Highway 42, this is the last stretch of making that a four-lane road from Trunk Highway 52 all the way over to Marshall Road with access to 17 between Dakota and Scott counties. And then County Highway 2 and 91, which was led by the city of Elko Newmarket with construction support from Scott County. And then 21 and 13, um, finally coming to a solution on that bottleneck corridor um, that had been struggling for several years. So just a couple pictures. Here is that diverging diamond um, at 41 and 169 that um, operates really well. I have a young driver in my family and he has managed to navigate it several times and knows how to operate it. So 
Here's a picture. Um, I think one of the things that's really, really important, quite often we talk about the interchanges and the overpasses, but it's those frontage roads and it's working with the townships and those cities to get that supporting roadway system in place that is just as important as the rest of that infrastructure. Um, you can see this frontage road here now that is constructed between 41 um, all the way down to the overpass of County Highway 49. It serves a rural industrial area like this well. Um, you can see that the actual access, the right in, right outs are a little bit south of that bridge, but people can access and then get to the frontage road system over on the east side of the road as well. And then here again was the ribbon cutting. I think several of the board members um, were at that that day, but the ribbon cutting um, that took place earlier this fall. This now takes us to County Highway 42 and another partnership project between um, uh, Prior Lake, the SMSC, and the city of Shakopee to complete the last phase of this 42. This is the 42 and 83 intersection um, being updated and then the extension um, of that four lanes. Here is again where there's an access point off of 42 that kind of meets that spacing for a highway of that caliber. Here's the entrance in at Mystic Lake and the work we did um, with the SMSC. They donated some right-of-way and some ponding land um, to help make this project again move forward. And then how it connects into the 17 overpass here. Um, this is probably one of the major improvements you now come off when you're northbound to eastbound into your own lane. If I remember right in talking with Tony, the couple crashes we've had out here since we put in this interchange were side swipes here converging. And so this will eliminate that and we should see um, increased safety. Um, prior to this overpass, I think we were averaging about one and a quarter fatalities a year out there for the years before it. So that was a tremendous safety improvement. And then the free lane that takes you up to Marshall Road headed north. Moving south now, you have another partnership project between the city of Elko Newmarket and the county. This is the County Highway 291 roundabout. Of course, Commissioner. That 91, I was just, because I take that a lot, since I've been here, has now got three roundabouts and a stoplight on it. <laughs> I don't know if anyone has ever thought that, but <laughs> it's, and it's a lot safer because, I mean, there was accidents and Life's lost on, on a lot of those spots, so it's, that's a good thing. So thank you. Yeah, no, please comment. These are all really, really positive things we're talking about here for our community that have happened in the year of this pandemic in 2020. Lots of good things. Still, we're moving forward. This is County Highway 21 now. Um, this is looking from, where am I here? I would be to the west, looking east. Um, you can see the... The roundabout, this was the modifications at Maine, which created a lot of that backup. They still have their left in axis and they can make right in, right outs with it. I'm leading into that roundabout at Trunk Highway 13. And here's an aerial from a pyre just over the roundabout. Um, you know, and when you have a two lane into a four lane, it really um, appears to help with some of the safety issues. So the design appears to be working very positively from public feedback and from staff feedback. Well, and I'm going to comment on that particular project. There was a face, several Facebook posts um, post construction that were incredibly positive about dueling roundabouts. When has that ever happened? <laughs> a positive comments, um, but B about roundabouts. So the, the design, the communication before that design, um, the signage, that both of those operate unbelievably well really really well um, so it's 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 fun to see that thing um, get the support it's gotten there's no waiting as much you know I mean there's a little bit of stacking but sometimes in the morning coming from this uh, going west from the east it, you'd wait for three or four oh, lights man. to turn to just to get through and I because I've been there I'm like oh, oh. My God. so anyhow but now it's a couple cars and you're through and if people complain about that it's Say, hey, it's better than it was, a lot better. Yeah, so. I know. P people are getting more used to roundabouts, but I think the signage goes a long way. That really helps on that one. Yeah, it's a combination. We learn more all the time. Absolutely, yep. So, leaving 2020 and all of the good things that happened, we're just going to preview what you're adopting as part of the budget here. 
for 2021. In transportation, they kind of list those overlays, right? It's an important part of what they do is maintaining our current infrastructure, and it is our number one priority. They receive some federal funds because that 42 is a principal arterial um, to help with that overlay. You have the 2 and 15 roundabout. You took action on um, that right-of-way, I believe, this morning, the County Highway 83 reconstruction, uh, which puts in the concrete pavement and is supporting some of the development that's going on over there um, in the city of Shakopee. The County Highway 27 reconstruction. Um, this is one that will start later in the fall. Most of the work will actually be done in 2022, but we're readying for the upgrade of 27 between 21 uh, moving up to 44 there. And then continued work with the city of Blakely um, on our turn back there. And what's that long-term vision? Uh, I think COVID delayed that, but what does that look like? How does the park work? What's that transportation need? And, and how do we come to a long-term vision down there? Um, the 169, 2829, you move that preliminary design in. We are setting ourselves up. If there are some um, transportation dollars that come available, the further we can get that design ready. Um, if there's one thing you learn, if you have some projects on the shelf, you might be able to spring into action. Um, the County Highway 16 extension um, with the city of Shakopee development continues over west of Marystown and heading towards County Highway 69. There's some bypass lanes in the road part of 27. Um, we have some bluff area, bluff drive area improvements that are gonna take place. Working with um, Carver County on the Minnesota River crossing study and then moving the County Highway 17 pedestrian bridge and making that connection between the transit station and some of those um, retail areas to the north. Parks. Um, we'll continue to work on some of these Blakely acquisitions. We've had property owners approach us um, that they are ready to sell or to take a look at selling. Um, those have been in and out of the CIP. Um, remember, 75% of that is a match from the Met Council and the regional funding, and the rest kind of sits in our little right-of-way fund. Um, some Doyle Kennefick acquisition, and then the Cleary Lake Regional Park Master Plan update, which has already started, and they're attempting to do some of this virtual, virtual and already have had some input. This also is the Regional Trail Master Plan update. So like the Scott West, the Miriam Junction, taking a look at our regional trails. We have more and more demand all the time for those regional trails and making connections. And man, if we can make a connection like at Miriam Junction where we can connect into Carver County system, people have access then all the way up into Hennepin County. And um, there is a demand to make those types of trips. Cleary Lake, road and parking lot seal coats. You'll see again, preservation. A lot of what we're doing is preserving. Um, looking at our trails, looking at our parking lots and making sure we take care of those for the public. And then the Spring Lake Trail microsurfacing as well. So buildings, um, the building chapter, obviously the completion of Government Center West. Sometime in March, we are gonna start with moving the county attorney's office and the third floor, our children's services, over to that building. Um, the Government Center East and the Justice Center renovation then will go under construction sometime in that March to April of 2021. Um, we also have the JAF indoor rec space that's waiting for the study on the JAF and some of that to be completed. We have a Marshall Road, the elevator upgrade, a radio tower HVAC upgrade. Um, the regional training facility has some carpeting that needs to be replaced. And then um, we have the Beacon supportive housing contribution that I just wanted to highlight as well in that late 21, 2022 time period. And I believe um, we have two folks that wanted to um, just comment on that here clearly this morning. I gave you a letter from um, the Shakopee School District on their support and some of their concerns that they have had. Dr. Redmond wasn't able to be here this morning. He had originally asked to, but had a, a meeting. But I think Dr. Johnson is on, um, and maybe we could ask him to provide a couple comments. Yeah, good morning, commissioners. Thank you for letting me be here. I am uh, here and I'm uh, like, I appreciate the opportunity to speak in support of this project just a little bit. Uh, my name is Monty Johnson. I'm the vice president of medical affairs at St. Francis. I'm also a practicing family physician in the community as well. I've been at uh, St. Francis for about the last four years. I'm uh, really uh, pleased to have the opportunity to speak on behalf of this Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative Project. 
and the request for some capital dollars to get this uh, get this project moving. I think it's uh, right in alignment with what we at the hospital believe is important in our community, and I, I appreciate this opportunity. We're focused a lot on health equity, and what does that really mean? It means making sure that all people have access to the right care in the right place and at the right time. And in order to do that, um, you know, you need to have a stable you need to have stable housing. And so I hope in my brief comments here today, you'll hear two things. Uh, from me that I hope you'll remember. One is that as a physician, uh, investments in projects like this, uh, like Prairie Point, improve health, period. They just do. And number two, as a hospital administrator, um, this kind of investment uh, saves healthcare dollars and reduces costs to everyone, including uh, those that live in those facilities and also the rest of the, the residents of our county as well. You know, we all know that there are clear health impacts for those who don't have stable housing. You know, the stress and burden of moving frequently, having to figure out how to pay rent, um, leads to stress, depression, and anxiety. Uh, we know that folks who don't have a stable home often have difficulty uh, just taking care of themselves, and, and particularly if they have chronic diseases like asthma, diabetes, or COPD. You know, we know that rates of diabetes, heart disease, and HIV are among the homeless population are up to six times as high as the general population. And so from a healthcare standpoint, there's no doubt that stable, uh, stable housing uh, for those folks really does improve their health. Uh, in terms of saving dollars, we know that folks who are in supportive housing and have services available to them are much less likely to address their health issues by using some of the most expensive ways that we have available to address health, which are hospital emergency rooms, and also um, you know, prolonged stays in the hospital while we try to figure out where, where's a safe place for this person without a home to go uh, once they're ready to leave the hospital. So you know, all of those things combined together, I think really, uh, really speak to the importance of a project like this. We focus on social determinants of health as a big upstream way to get ahead of the, the problems that we see when folks uh, come to the hospital. And so, you know, I just want to take a minute to say thank you uh, for, for considering this project. I hope that you uh, will find it to be as, uh, as important to the, co the county and to our, our citizens and our residents as, as we at the hospital do and uh, appreciate your time and attention to this. So with that, I'm, I will um, I'll stop and uh, see if anybody has any questions for me. Otherwise, I think um, there may, uh, we may have uh, someone else that's here today to speak on this as well. So I'll stop there. Any questions for Dr. Jones? Okay. And then I think uh, Lee Lyons from uh, Beacon just wanted to add a couple words as well. Thank you. I'm Lee Blanz, the CEO of Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative, and I'll keep my remarks very short. I want to thank you on behalf of our Collaborative of Congregations for your support of Prairie Point. I want to thank each of you for taking the time to meet with us and the many supporters in the community over the past two years. I want to thank the county staff, uh, Leslie and Pam, and, and all of the staff for their support and leadership. We believe that by working together that our model for family supportive housing has been improved. Scott County is committed to creating a continuum of housing that meets the needs of all of its residents. And we appreciate the significant financial commitment that Scott County is making today so that those with the lowest incomes in the community are included. Your funds will leverage charitable giving as well as returning taxpayer dollars from the state, the Met Council and the federal government to the benefit of Scott County residents. I would be remiss if I didn't also thank you for the continued support of our shelter program, Families Moving Forward. I am pleased to commit to you that Prairie Point will benefit very low income Scott County families, helping them not only survive, but to thrive. Prairie Point will be an asset to the whole community, to the schools and to the healthcare system. And I commit to you that Prairie Point will be a partnership that the county, our congregations in Beacon will be proud of for decades to come. We believe that we all do better when we all have a home. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. All right, so leaving the building chapter, another big area of investment next year is technology. Um, and we are going to move forward with the Sheriff Body Squad cameras, which is, uh, was on hold this year based on understanding and financial and seeing where we were, but that one is in the process of moving forward. The Advanced Traffic Management System, which is some of the coordination. If you remember, we let the fiber project, that was completed this year, so now this is the software and the integration portion ready to go. Um, transportation Project Management, uh, this is a software to help with some of their status and their management and funding and cost. 
Um, we also have the document management for employment and training. So we've heard a lot of positives about the HHS side of that moving forward as we're going into our move here. We have um, one portion of caseworks for ENT here that is left to do that will move forward going into 2021. And then um, we put on hold that vital license permit portal um, where the people, folks could access through this portal. Um, as we knew going into this year, our staff couldn't handle it. We had an election going on and we had everything else that we were dealing with this year with the new system, um, with the state for licenses and those types of things. So we actually delayed that consciously till 2021 and that will move forward next year as well. Whoops. Um, Skype for business. So this transition to Teams, we've bought the phones, we've been upgrading Skype. And so now this transition to Teams will take place in 2021. We have some active directory cleanup um, from a security standpoint and those things we need to complete. Uh, we are gonna migrate that Zix um, that you folks talk about, email encryption to the Office 365 encryption as people have moved towards that, um, our partners. The annual device rotation, we got a lot of that done this year. We advanced, if you remember, quite a bit of that, but the tough books, they are so expensive. We need to live the life of those. Um, many of those will be rotated out next year in the sheriff's office. And then we have our capital replacement for our technology, um, where we have a rotation on some of the replacement of switches and those types of things that will take place next year as well. In the capital equipment chapter, we have the survey department has a GPS um, survey piece of equipment as well as transportation for their work in the field that will be updated and, and switched out. And then Fleet has some portable lifts that we use in the shop um, that have ended and met their lifespan that we need to change out for safety purposes. The other area of the capital equipment program is the fleet, right? We invest about $1.1 million a year or so in the fleet. Um, we have an all-wheel drive for environmental services. Um, we have a crew cab for facilities. And then in the highway area, the heat and asphalt recycler, a couple tandem trucks, a couple uh, mowers, one a side and one a rear and then a four-wheel drive pickup for the uh, program delivery side of it. And in the sheriff's office, we have nine squad cars, seven marked and two unmarked. And then the VETS bus is scheduled to be rotated out um, next year as well. So that is our CIP. There is a lot of things that were done. We have a lot to do next year as well, um, but would stand for any questions on the CIP before I turn the budget over to Danny. Questions or comments online or in the house? I just would say, Mr. Chair and Leslie, everyone, it's, I mean, some significant accomplishments in a most difficult year. I, I think every time and this, we've seen this, we've talked about it, but to see all that's been going on in 2020 and how staff still sometimes smile and are nice and, and <laughs> like wow a lot has been done in this year that has posed all kinds of challenges sam when you said that I'm, when you said that comment i'm looking out at lisa but she's got her mask on <laughs> she's smiling she's waving her hands is she still smiling i can't see chris but um <laughs> they're still true. smiling they are well they thank are. you and i'll turn it over to danny here thank you good is it still morning good morning <laughs> Right, is everyone seeing the 2021 yes. levy budgeted option? Yep, everyone's, it's on both screens, so we're good. All right, um, just note real quickly, we are presenting on both 6.3 and 6.4 at the same time, and at the end we'll have the individual resolutions to be approved by the board. Um, I would like to start off by noting, in addition to the commissioners and Leslie's comments about the work that staff has done, um, I have been through several years of budget reductions in my career so far and expect that there will be more at some other point, but this one did pro uh, have unique challenges to it because staff were also looking at how do we do reductions and manage this tighter dollars than normal, but also they were changing every aspect of their operation as well as every aspect of their life while also coming in and doing some very hard work. Um, so I think that should just be noted as we come into this. Um, this isn't just a regular budget reduction, which is really never regular, but it's on top of the various challenges that we've had this year. So as we go into any budget year, we do have our consistent board policy and direction of long-term fiscal stability while minimizing tax impacts, reasonable level constant tax burdens, and we model out limited and relatively level increases, 
and we do manage limited resources over unlimited demands, and we had to do that again this year. And we want to make sure we meet our necessary mandated and services and citizen expectations. Maintain fiscal stability through a structurally balanced budget, managing our reserves and maintaining them at adequate levels, maintaining our bond rating, plan and prepare for the future, which I think as we look through the CIP and some of these other things, we do a very good job of planning for that future. And then don't spike the levy, no surprises. And I know all of you know how hard we work to mitigate those surprises. When we talk about a structurally balanced budget, we really look at the three different components of it. What is the tax burden on our residents and is it at a reasonable level? The quality of the programs and services and meeting state requirements within that. Um, sometimes I know that we can debate with the state as whether we are uh, providing quality services at the levels that they are requiring. And then also the needs of our taxpayers, clients, and the staff in the organization. So going into this year, uh, for the 2021 budget, our budget development goals were to fund the salary and benefits increases per our uh, union contracts, maintaining critical operations throughout this pandemic, keep the levy increase to a minimum, and then also implement a multi-year budget reduction plan. We were able to fund our salary and benefit increases. It keeps us uh, competitive in the market, um, and it keeps our, with our current compensation strategy, maintained our capital while planning for the future, able to fund financial system replacement through this budget, um, and also to bring on board into the operating budgets those software implementations and other costs that have been um, identified through the CIP. Funds required expenditures for buildings and contracts. We have new building operating costs, managed services costs, and the bringing the treatment court into the operating budget. Budget cuts will have an impact on this organization though, but we all believe that they all will be sustainable. And it does maintain critical operations and services. So going back to January, February, before our entire world and lives changed, we knew this was gonna be a very difficult budget year. Um, we had a 3.71% levy increase projected for 2021 prior to having any new requests or needs. Very little, if any, easy cuts that we believe are left in the organization. We've added very few new items over the years and frequently when we did that, we did that by repurposing existing funds or staffing um, to meet those needs. And our approach to the budget has consistently been to eliminate capacity when we find it um, in order to keep that levy suppressed and low for our residents. And the divisional work didn't just start with the 2021 budget. We started 20 or came into 2020, realized that we were going to have a deficit very early on in the year. Probably April, we started discussing what was that deficit going to look like. $1.2 million were needed from the budget for this year to make up for that shortfall. And this is really driven by revenue losses um, from outside organizations that usually provide contributions as well as lack of job turnover, which we rely on um, to cover a certain number of expenses. For 2021, we identified over $6.6 .6 million in potential reductions that departments really had to dig down deep into their organizations. It would have meant eliminating over 35 FTE and it probably would not have been achievable for 2021 without a significant disruption, disruption to services. As working through this with the board over several work sessions, um, the board did provide us the flexibility to use a multi-year reduction strategy. We worked assuming revenues would come in close to projections, make cuts of, of opportunity that are less painful for 2021, identify and begin work on changes for businesses for 2022, and then utilize one-time cuts or fund balance to make up the difference in the short term. Our final levy that we're bringing forward today is 1.99%. This will keep the county on stable footing, we maintain services at a sustainable level while reducing costs and we meet our union contract obligations and it keeps Scott County a competitive employer. Our financial obligations are on a steady path for the future. Our debt is fully funded. Um, our, I have a healthy fund balance coming out of this and the levy, levy is on a stable path and we don't project any spikes over our five-year model. We did set the preliminary levy at 2.52% um, because at the time we did not know what the state's financial picture was going to look like. Uh, the current state budget projections have eased our concerns quite significantly um, for that so that we don't believe that there's gonna be a county program aid reduction for 2021. We are using fund balance in one time and some additional ongoing reductions that got us from that 2.52 to 1.99%. Um, if we went much lower than that 1.99%, we would break one of our policies and our approaches to the budget where it would cause a spike in the levy in out years 
um, and make it more significantly difficult to keep that kind of level and stable levy increases over the model. So what's included in increases for the 2021 budget? We had about $1.3 million in increased funding requests. Primarily those were from um, agreements that were implemented in prior years where additional funding was kicking in for the 2021 budget. Um, as well as some for state mandates or contracts that have a built-in inflator within them. Um, almost nothing came in, and I don't believe we had anything new come in from departments independently saying, I need something additional. They kept those requests down and really said, we are mandated by the state and this cost is going to go up, or a contracted shared cost came up, like the medical examiners where that's split on their actual usage, um, that we saw a little increase there. Salary and benefits come in at about $2.4 million for the increase. Utilities postage insurance about $167,000. We had just over a million dollars in increased grant expenditures. The biggest factor though is we lost $1.4 million in revenue. Um, so our total increase in the budget of expenses, kind of balancing out some weird math with the revenue, about $6.35 million. So what have we done to limit that? We did have a little bit over $1. million, more than offsetting the increased grant expenditures and grant revenue. Um, typically not as high as we'd like to see, but it's still more than offset the increased costs. Our divisions came in with $1.19 million in ongoing budget reductions. These are things that are not going to come back in 2022. These things are gone and are no longer included in our five-year model. $116,000 in discretionary services reductions ongoing to some of our partners that we provide supports to. We were able to achieve some savings from doing a bond refunding for about $140,000, and that goes up uh, for 2022. And then we had almost about $1.26 million in one-time reductions for 2021, with 700,000 of that coming from transportation services for reductions in state aid, and $564,000 from various areas within the organization to make that up. So. To make up that last bit of the budget, we were planning on using $1.14 million in fund balance for 2021 for a total reductions or revenue increases of just under $5 million. So that gets us to a $1.4 million increase in the budget for a tax levy increase of 1.99%. Mr. Chair, can I make a comment? Absolutely. Can I make a comment, Danny? Please. I just, I just have to point out because I think, you know, we've seen this so many times. We're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you to staff. That one point, almost one point two million in ongoing budget reductions. That's huge. I mean, I'm sure they found a way to do that while they're still providing more services, and that's what I think we ask them to do. I think Commissioner Beer, you often say we need to find that. We need to find those things. So. I just feel like as a board, you know, before we adopt this, we need to say thank you for doing that. I mean, it was hard enough, I'm sure, to do the 1.2 million in one-time reductions, but those other ones, that's a really big deal that I guess all of us should be proud of that we're able to do that. And now we need to watch and make sure that that doesn't jeopardize services too much and, and we need to be willing to watch and see and, and react if we have to. But thank you for that hard work. Thank you, Commissioner Wickman Brecky. Yeah, this whole year seems like it's been one big, well, you can fill in the blank, but what I'm going to say is one, <laughs> one big budget workshop. Yeah. Um, you know, January, February was kind of like there's this thing coming. March is like, okay, it's here. April, it's here. Um, so it's been a scramble. And as we see in our one of our later items, it's still a scramble because things are just ever-changing. Um, and remind me again, our growth rate for the county is 1.92%. That is accurate. And so we're looking at a 1.99% increase. And that's a guy that's always said, hey, I want to live on growth alone, and we're flirting with it. Um, I did, didn't think it'd take a pandemic to get there. Um, and a lot of hard work, a lot of hard work. Um, yeah, it's, it's uh, wow. A crazy year, a lot of work, um, everyone's scrambling. Um, finding new ways to do things, um, to do old things, old ways to do new things, um, and here we are. So it's, uh, <laughs> I honestly never thought we'd be here, but here we are. Mm -hmm. So thank you, everybody. I don't know what camera's working, but, um, you know, this was a Herculean effort. It still remains a Herculean effort, um, and here we are trying to put our best foot forward. So 
Well, thank, thank you. For you. That. I know the staff appreciate it. I know that they are probably tired of me and Steve oh. coming back to them again and again and again saying, okay, we need another one. We need another way of looking at this. Can you get rid of this? So, Well, everyone's looking um, in more ways than one to take a second, catch your breath. And yeah. this year has not allowed us to do that. Um, and around the corner, yeah, I think there's a corner, but it's still a lot of hard work yet to be done. And we've got some really good people that are still really willing to do that, which is super awesome. So you know who you are. Thank you for doing that. Any other questions or we'll move on? Comments? Looking to my left, looking to my right, looking online, anything? Mr. Chairman, are you ready for a, a motion? We're about two thirds of the way through the presentation. We're almost but if there. You're done with me. I'm happy to move on. No, we're we're still. <laughs> He's still, there's a little fire behind that uh, lectern. You can't see it, so his feet are to it. So we're almost there. All right. All right. Tell me when you're ready. <laughs> so as we talk about a lot in our um, budget development goals and looking at the policy, we do have a five-year financial model that we use to make sure that we are not spiking the levy and addressing things, um, as well as the fact that the board did approve a multi-year budget reduction strategy, which is why I want to talk a little bit more about the forecast than we typically do in other years. Um, so moving to a 1.99% as opposed to that 1.92 does provide us some additional relief and help push down that levy a little bit for 2022. We have already identified low or no impact savings for the 2022 budget that does close our budget gap from what we're currently projecting. Um, so we talked about that multi-year strategy and here you're seeing it in reality. Um, the remainder of the bond refunding that we did for 2021, the savings goes up again in 2022, um, helps to fill that gap. And then we had some actions earlier that the board took about paying off the medical examiner facility as well as the ERTS facility that saves us over $300,000 in our financial forecast. Um, with the stuff that we've already incorporated into the 2021 budget, that should equate to a little bit over $1.6 million in overall reductions um, going forward, which in our model puts us in a much better financial footing than where we would have been without that. We already have included OPEB savings um, for that 2022 year, and this is when our bond payment, um, the increased bond payment for the new building comes on board. We have about $500,000 in levy savings that has been already incorporated into our financial numbers. We do still have short staffing in certain areas that are a concern that we'll have to keep a close eye on over the next few years. We have the final year of transitioning funding for treatment court to come in in 2022. Operational funding for CIP projects have been incorporated in the levy. Um, and then the expiration of the sales tax is impacting the forecast in 2024. Um, but transportation services and transit were able to carry some funds over. Uh, so some one-time sales tax dollars have pushed that from 2023 into 2024 for that impact would also uh, help keep down a spike in the levy. So I appreciate their work on that. So included in that 2022 forecast, we have the ME facility savings, ERTS, the bond refunding, um, workforce center operating savings that we're projecting in there. Um, and then Arvig fiber agreement revenue increase that is coming in, something that was accomplished actually a couple of years ago um, that is starting to bear some fruition and provide some revenue for us. We also do have some increased expenses and revenue losses that we're expecting right now. Uh, our CPA just based on the formulaic change is going down by about $85,000, at least in the projection. Jail revenue, which we've actually been feathering out for the last several years, is going down 61000 We have continued investment in our financial system replacement of 187000 Managed service cost increase, which should be the last year of it, of 18000 That last year of treatment court, like I mentioned, some CIP operating costs. And then this is more of a plug. It's an estimate, but $100,000 in some of the operating costs for some of these CARES projects we've taken on. Where we've purchased software that is hoping to get us through the pandemic. Um, that we're estimating we'll have to keep some of it. A lot of it was already part of a CIP plan that we've moved around sometimes, um, but we've built that into the budget so we have some capacity in our forecast financial model here. As we get into the out years, it's actually not quite as many increases as we sometimes have, but 2023 is still gonna be a tough year. That last year, the N4 upgrade replacement funding, um, and then we're expecting a cut to our administrative uh, um, revenue, the administrative costs we get to keep for a contracted case management of about 343000 We're estimating a little bit on the uh, worst case scenario side, but we want to be prepared and prefer to get good news as opposed to more bad news. And then some CIP operating costs. And then in 2024, we are losing that sales tax funding in our current model until that's 
approved or the board would extend it. We do not assume that it's going to be in our forecast in those out years. Also throughout the forecast, we do project 2.75% general wage adjustment, 3% health insurance increases, as well as 3.1% revenue increases. And really just based on the current modeling, I'd expect the levy to come in around 4% over the next few years. Um, based on our current assumptions, knowing staff needs, our historical increases, and assuming we're not going through additional reductions over the next few years, um, unless the board directs us otherwise going forward. So this is the picture of our current five-year model based on the property tax levy, which is the red number or the red line, and then the property tax percentage increase year over year as the blue line. So coming in at 1.99% for 2021, we are expecting, and while this looks kind of like a spike, this is really kind of getting back to where we have been in the past, at 3.42% for 2022 is our current starting point, um, and holding fairly steady there over the next couple of years with a dip down in 2025. Just remind the commissioners, we typically do have a dip down in the out years just because we don't have as many things that are already built into the financial model at this point in the year. And then our operating budget, and uh, the primary takeaway for this is to really look at our fund balance and cash flow. Um, so you'll see that our, our fund balance is going up a little bit for 2021 based on some savings we were able to achieve, uh, particularly with CARES Act support. Um, so we are at, I don't know how I did that. 37.26% of our operating budget is available in fund balance. And then as we see going out the five-year model, it starts to decline because we do not budget to increase our fund balance. So as our budget gets bigger, that fund balance automatically goes down even if we didn't spend any money out of that fund balance. This blue line on the bottom is our minimum cash flow that we like to maintain. And we don't want this number ever to drop below 5% because then we start struggling in order to make those payments for grants and for salaries as we wait for revenue to come in through the course of the year. Then this kind of pea green line here shows the actual fund balance in dollars that we're projecting right now. Hey, remind me again, um, both of these lines or one of these lines the state likes to get out their stick and slap you on the back of the hand if you fall between down below a certain number? Is that on top line or bottom line or both? The both? top line is oh. the one that they look at. Okay. Um, they like us to maintain a fund balance of about between 30 to 50%. 30 is that floor because then they start to get concerned that cities and counties aren't going to be able to make payments that they need to. Um, so we are well below the one that we don't want too much of, right. which would be that 50%. Um, but I think we're in a healthier position than we have been in some time in terms of the bottom of that, which gives us some more flexibility to do some things with our fund balance if need be. Thanks. I would also note, I know there was a number of uses of fund balance um, earlier on the agenda. None of those fund balance numbers were incorporated into these projections. So that those were dollars that we had not been relying on um, as we look at this. So it's not reflecting a major spend down of that beyond that $1.2 million that I referenced in this presentation. All right, now just a little bit into our data. And this picture is kind of blocking my view. Let's see. So this just shows what the CPI uh, and the new construction percentage change were, which is kind of our um, guiding post for where we want the levy to come in. We usually stay or try to stay sometime around there. Um, and I would just note the numbers on this. This goes from a 0% levy to a 5%. So we even look at this where we have spikes. If we had this be up to 50%, we would show a very flat trend in terms of where our levy comes in year over year. Um, we are just a tick over new construction, but below that uh, CPI and new construction percentage change um, that we use as our guiding post for where we bring in the levy. Value changes will drive most increases to residential property taxes. Home with a 5% or less increase in value will generally see decreases in the county portion of their taxes. Impact on the average home with a taxable market value increase from 318,000 to 332,000 or 4.4% will be a decrease of about $17 for their county property taxes this year. This shows the number of residential properties seeing an increase or decrease in their property taxes. So on the right-hand side of the slide, they're showing a decrease. 
60% of Scott County residential property taxpayers will see a decrease in their property taxes and right about 40% would see an increase with the vast majority of that being in the $10 to $49 range of an increase. This shows our Scott County property tax rate. Since 2016, we've gone from a 36.19% property tax or a tax rate to 30.85%. Significant decrease in just under 10% um, over the last eight years is what the decrease in our tax rate has been. Whoa. Are they still seeing me online? It, Zoom says connecting. Well, that's where um, I just, uh, because the text was lost. Yeah, it's because there's any more. Yeah, it's because there's any more. Like stalling and it's making really fast. All right, maybe I'll give it a second to see if it reconnects here. back yes. i believe so we right. hear you yeah we got a technical i think thing we lost everyone commissioner i reconnected yep i'm back on now too can you let me know where you lost me to make sure i don't need to go back well we no, need to make sure back, please i'm down to about 20 percent battery left there so <laughs> can you share your screen as well danny oh, dude, stop yeah, there we go Yep, mm -hmm. seems like I'm on both screens. All right. So we did a quick comparison of 2010 to 2021 taxes um, for the average value home. So on the left, that home value is the average value home for 2010, 2020, and 2021. Um, for that same value home, for a $276,000 home, going from 2020 to 2021, they would have seen a $50 decrease in their taxes. And going from 2010 to 2021, they still would have seen a $25 decrease in their taxes if their home value had not changed. For a $318,000 house, it would have been $60 from 2020 to 21 and $52 from 2010 to 2021. And for that $332,000 home, so the average value home for this year, compared to that same value home in 2020, it would have been a $60 decrease. And that same value home in 2010, it would have been a $61 increase. This is just an attempt to kind of show one of these different ways in our funky tax system, um, what has happened to these home values and the taxes that Scott County collects on them. Um, but for that average value home, we have seen a decline even going back to 2010 um, compared to what it would be now. This is levy as a percentage of our annual budget. I need to move this again. So our operating budget, um, the levy makes up 50.5%. And there we go, that's better. Um, the capital budget, levy makes up the 13% of that budget. And for the capital, it does fluctuate based on um, state or federal grants that we receive. And you'll see that kind of uh, slow trend down to where we are just barely over 50% funded from the levy for our budget. Credit rating has been reconfirmed as AAA this year when we did the refunding, despite it being a tough fiscal year for anybody doing a refunding. And our county tax levy per capita has gone ticked up one dollar over from 2020 to 2021, and it's only gone up twenty-three dollars going back to 2016 for Scott County property tax levy. Danny, can you go back to that one again? Can this one, the, the per capita. Per, yeah. Yep. You said it went up one dollar per per capita, capita per resident. Yep. Okay. Okay. All right, I got it. And so while that's going up, another one we look at is the percentage of personal income 
um, that we take as part of our property tax levy. So if you look for all communities that assess property tax levy per personal income in Scott County, it has gone from 3.04% in 2015 to 3.07% in 2019. And that's actually a decline of 5% from last year. The percentage of people's income that all communities that assess property taxes collects to fund their operations. And then for Scott County specifically, we have gone from 0.75% to 0.74% in the percentage of personal uh, income that we collect as part of that tax levy. And it's actually down even more from looking back to 2015 where we're at 0.79% purpose of this slide is to show that the percentage of income that we are taking to fund our operations has continually been going down um, for the residents of Scott County for all the personal income generated here. And with that, staff would recommend the board adopt resolution number 2020-2019 setting the Scott County Minnesota gross levy for taxes payable in the year 2021 in the amount of 78,500,211 less 5,962,211 certified property tax aids for a net levy of $72,538,000. All right, thank you very much. Time for questions and comments and motions. I kind of said my piece Chairman, earlier. I'd be happy to move uh, resolution 2020-219. Second. We have a motion and a second on item 6.3 or adopt or resolution number 2020-219. Any discussion? Well, I'll just uh, uh, reinforce or give a ditto to what uh, Commissioner uh, Brecky said and others have said, uh, what a great amount of work this has been and a, and a tremendous effort. So I, I want to say thank you and applaud all those efforts. Indeed, that does not go unnoticed for sure. All right, with that, JJ is ready to go. Commissioner Wickman Brecky? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. <laughs> Commissioner Oreck? Aye. <laughs> you lose your connection there for a minute? I would just note, I believe that's the first uh, eye on the uh, levy from Commissioner Beer. so. Seven hundredths off of growth. All right, and then as we did mention at the beginning, we are uh, doing just one presentation for 6.3 or 6.4. Um, so we do have a recommended budget, but I would be happy to answer any questions related to the budget as well. But the recommendation is the board adopt resolution 2020-220, approving the 2021 budget for Scott County, Minnesota, um, offices, departments, and agencies, and adopting a capital improvement plan. All right, we've had the presentation, so what's your pleasure? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Otherwise, JJ, take it away. Commissioner Wickman Brecky? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Beer? Aye. Commissioner Ulrich? Aye. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank the commissioners because they've had to sit and listen to me many, many, many times this year for very long-winded presentations. So I appreciate your patience with me. Well, you know, budgets is always front and center. And this year, wow, I'm not sure it ever left um, front. It was always center, that's for sure, and, and rightfully so. Um, this baby was wrestled to the ground, no doubt about it. Uh, moving on to item number 6.5, we're going to be looking to adopt resolution number 2020-230, approving the final 2021 levy of $1,290,914 and the budget for the Scott Watershed Management Organization, the WMO Special Taxing District. Good morning, and it is still morning, Mr. Chair. Let me check. I got to check that. You're right. It is. <laughs> it, it is my pleasure. Uh, my name is Vanessa Strong. I'm the Water Resources Supervisor for Scott County and Scott WMO. Uh, and I want to thank you all for this wonderfully long morning with all of your attention. Uh, today, I'm just going to review the request to approve the final 2021 levy of $1,290,914 and budget 
for the Scott Watershed Management Organization and Special Taxing District. So I am going to just share a few slides that summarize and highlight the request. And it would be wonderful if you'd be so kind as to just let me know when you can see my screen. Thank we you. can see it. Appreciate that. Never know when it's coming through long distance how long that'll take. So to start, just to give you a little bit of background, a public hearing to receive comments on the proposed 2021 budget and levy was actually held on October 26, 2020 at the SWMO Watershed Planning Commission meeting. No comments were received at that public hearing uh, the commission did review and recommend approval of the budget and levy and obviously a copy of the final 21-21 budget 2021 budget and levy is attached next slide maybe next slide there we go. sorry about that so a few highlights in revenue. Overall revenue is noticeably down when we compare it with the past 10 years. But the decrease in revenue does reflect a new norm in grant funding. State and federal agencies are no longer issuing multi-million dollar grant awards with the Sand Creek targeted grant of around 5 million that we're just finalizing and wrapped up. Uh, today's grants, however, are more stable than competitive grants in the years past, which is wonderful. However, the in exchange, the overall maximum grant awards are smaller, and on average, they do require a larger match from the partner agencies. Uh, in addition, you'll notice uh, if you compared this year's revenue to previous year's revenue, uh, it is down overall roughly about $60,000 in total. Uh, the SWO at the same time has been still very successful at achieving grants as we have been in years past. Uh, the one downside is that these revenues are not reflected in the budget until they have been encumbered. So what you're seeing right now in revenue are encumbered grants that we believe will be coming in for this year. Now, some of those grants that we do expect to come in that we are awarded this year uh, do include an EPA, MPCA, Nine Elements Plan Grant Award for $284,275,000. Uh, we have the Bowser Watershed Management Plan Implementation Funding Proposal, i say saying that five times fast, for a total of $310,000. Uh, and then there is the 2021 and 2022 bonding bill grant uh, that the county and WMO received for $600,000 for the McMahon Lake Outlet Project. But as I mentioned, we won't see the revenue from those projects and grants until future years, starting at earliest, probably 2022. So when we take a look at our final budget and expenses for 2021, uh, overall, the total expenses are down about $100,000 from previous years. Uh, we worked very diligently and made every effort possible to make uh, as many cuts as possible uh, we have cuts in both administration and regulation from previous years. Uh, some of the deeper cuts we did have to make were the education and outreach budget. And unfortunately, we just are trying to balance the budget as much as possible. Uh, for the past several years, the SWMO has contributed most of the funds to support the Scott County Watershed Education Partnership, which most of you are familiar with. Uh, but many of the other partners have withdrawn. Uh, unfortunately, the SWMO cannot sustain that themselves, and so we've had to reduce some of that funding. Uh, we have had to postpone a few of those activities and are working with the Soil Water Conservation District, which implements a lot of that, uh, to find additional partners and, and funding sources. Uh, another uh, reduction in funding that is pretty noticeable is actually in our cost share program. Uh, there has in fact been an increase in cost share, oops, in cost share demands than previous years. Uh, and in fact, we actually exhausted our cost share project fundings for the first time in July of this year. Uh, and there, we actually have a whole list of applicants still on the wait list. Uh, but unfortunately, it's just simply necessary to reduce some of that funding because we don't have as many grants to offset those project costs. 
So those are kind of some of the larger cuts to our budget for this year. Uh, that being said, our land and water treatment program, which is generally our largest program, uh, does have a, an increase in its overall budget. That piece is up about $100,000 almost, and about $80,000. Uh, and the reason for that is, again, we're trying to come up with that higher match required for some of these grants we were awarded for the nine elements plan as well as uh, we received that $600,000 bonding bill grant for McMahon Lake Outlet. Uh, it does require a significant match up front, so we had to kind of dive deep over the last month to figure out where we we're gonna come up with that $300,000 match. I was able to come up with about $100,000 out of the SWMO budget, uh, and then so that's reflected then in the land and water treatment detail. And can I ask Mr. Chair and Vanessa, how, how's that thing rolling along that Cole McMahon thing? Is that everything's on track and it'll be complete by June of next year? Uh, that's a great question, Mr. Uh, Commissioner. That project is moving along forward. Uh, 2021 is identified for design and uh, permitting. And then 2022 will actually be the year we do the installation of the outlet. So at the moment it is on track and moving along and uh, we're just working out some of those agreement details and uh, contract details. So you'll actually, the commissioners will see this probably coming before them late January again. Uh, we've also been reaching out to the townships uh, to work with them on the updates on the grant as well as the residents are working on putting together a lake improvement district so that long term they're able to take on ownership and responsibility off of the uh, outlet device itself. Uh, that's at least our goal right now. But in answer to your question, yes, it is moving along uh, and the timeline is as I identified. Okay, so. thank you. Yeah, no, great question. Uh, I can talk about it all day, but I know we have a short window and you've been here a long I'll time. I'll later because I have more questions. <laughs> We've got another qu comment. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I just want to add to Vanessa that we are doing some research on the long-term ownership and maintenance of this. Oh, yeah. And Jeannie and Brad and Cindy are researching that. We certainly have the matching funds committed. You approved them today in the CIP, and we intend to do that. But the long-term ownership and maintenance needs mm -hmm. some stable source of a government entity that can assess and do those types of things. The county boards in the past have not been open to owning the Spring Lake or the Clarks Lake or wanting to be part of the Spring Lake, Spring Lake Prior Lake Watershed Outlet. And so trying to understand that, and you know, we've learned both from the medical examiner and the ERTS facility, the importance of having that hammered out up front. Yep. So we have a clear understanding of that when we go to the state. And so that's some of the work and the research right now that Mr. Davis and Ms. Geis and Ms. Anderson are working on as we move forward. Thanks for that. All right. So to summarize, the final budget for the Scott WMO is actually 72% land and water treatment. It's up from previous years that were around 70%, only up about 2%, but it is still an increase. Uh, the levy increase is $37,599 total. Uh, or about 3%. Uh, the approved watershed management plan, for those of you that have that memorized and sleep with it near and dear to your heart, uh, is table 5.6. Uh, that actually has an annual 3% increase plus a 2.5 inflation of expenses for a total of 5.5%. Now, obviously during this unique year and with uh, the McMahon grant, uh, we kind of had to balance what was approved in the watershed management plan and, and try to make as many cuts as possible. Uh, we were able to bring it down to, to 3%. Uh, we had brought it down a bit further, but with McMahon coming in, uh, we had to really delve deep to figure out where we were gonna come up with that match. Um, we did have to, in fact, dip into our fund balance and, and that does leave our projected fund balance at about 30% of operating expenses overall, which is kind of, as, as you mentioned, as you remember Danny mentioning, it's about the bottom of the bottom of where we want to be. Uh, however, I think we will be able to uh, implement all of our necessary projects and pro programs, still deliver a really high value projects and programs to our residents, uh, meet our goals and implement our plan, and still only have an average market value resident impact 
of about 49 cents increase. So with that, I would stand for any questions. All right, thank you very much. Questions, comments? Uh, I would just comment, Vanessa, and, and to everyone who worked on it, I, I do appreciate that uh, we didn't just kind of status quo go with the increase allowed by the plan and, and found that um, ability to get down to the 3% and, and totally understand the McMahon Lake project, which we have to be somewhat accountable for utilizing that grant dollars because we asked for them, and that's going to take some money. So just wanted to share my appreciation. Anything else? Any other questions, comments? Otherwise, we've got a resolution on the table. Mr. Chair, I'll move approval of the watershed budget for 2021. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on resolution number 2020-230 as presented? Otherwise, JJ. It's Commissioner Wick Membrecki. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer. Aye. Commissioner Ulrich. Aye. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to item 6.6, .6, looking to adopt resolution number 2020-244. And I see Lori on the screen, so I won't read any more than that. <laughs> Perfect. Good morning, Commissioners. So I am here today to request adoption of resolution number 2020-244, approving extension of the Families First Coronavirus Act provisions through February 28th of 2020. Throughout the COVID pandemic, the county has worked hard to protect the health and safety of employees, their families, customers, the public, while at the same time delivering county services that have continued to be needed out there. In March, the federal government passed the Families First Coronavirus Act, and that act enabled two very important protections. The first being to assure the workforce with job protection when COVID impacts them and their families. And the second is to safeguard public health by assisting employees with paid time so they don't have to go to work when they're sick. As rolled out, the act is set to expire on December 31st but there's speculation by some that the act will be extended between now and then, and actually between now and the end of January. However, there's no definitive action on that at this point. With the rising COVID numbers in the community and kids doing distance learning in most districts, employees who are currently authorized this leave are growing more anxious about what's going to happen at the end of the month. Administrator Vermillion, Deputy Administrator Lenz and I, we've been out doing DWM meetings and hearing from staff about the stressors of COVID. This is one stressor that we can help alleviate. With this action, we would simply extend the protections of the act through February 28th of 2021. That will allow us to get through the current period of increased cases, see if the act is extended and relieve the uncertainty for those who are directly impacted. We understand the need to be prudent with financial resources. Any cost for backfilling or overtime do believe will be covered by fund balance dollars committed to the COVID response. Staff members have been super judicious throughout all of this in the use of this leave. And we see them using flex scheduling first and foremost to balance work and non-work obligations. This action is one of support for our committed workforce. The resolution is written such that it would be superseded by law if state or federal action is taken. Additionally, it only extends the time period leave may be used. It doesn't enable new leave or add additional leave benefits. So with that, I will take any questions that you may have for me. All right, thank you very much. Any questions or comments for Lori on this resolution? Chairman, I move adoption of resolution 2020-2244. We have a motion. Second. Second. We have a couple seconds. Any further discussion on this matter? Otherwise, JJ, please. Commissioner Wickman Brecky? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Ulrich? Aye. Thank you very much. 
All right, I'm looking out in the hall. Back by popular demand, it is the Chris and Lisa show. So, Commissioner, uh... Mr. Chairman, I'm going to intro this by you had a resolution in front of you that we had submitted last week right. when our items are due. At that point, we still did not have any direction from the state of Minnesota on whether they were going to implement um, any type of a small business program. Heard they were, and then it was going to be delayed after the first of the year, and then it was back on the table. You had made it very clear um, in your work session that you thought our businesses were hurting right now and that we should be looking at getting some dollars on the um, street to them as soon as possible here before the holidays. So we put together um, a program that would have utilized some fund balance uh, to do that. The state then took action yesterday, uh, late in the afternoon, to move forward um, a small business program that, that Chris is going to, and Lisa are going to talk about here in, in a minute, um, and then the county's role in that. So that means we are really not going to look forward to bringing forward the resolution you saw. Um, and we also have some updates on the chambers that changed in that same time frame last week um, with things that are moving parts there as well. Um, but the one thing I did want to add before they start is um, in an email this morning from Stacy that I, I just want to bring up the positive impact with the work that folks have done today um, with the CARES money, put out $3.418 million to businesses in our community with 302 local grants over the past few months with that first program. And um, I won't go into each of the individual townships, even though they had as many as 13 in Cedar Lake Township. But the city of Belle Plaine, for example, received 23 grants at about $242,000. Elko Newmarket, 15 at $143,000. Um, Jordan, 11, $132,000. New Prague, 17, $189,000. 48 grants went to the city of Prior Lake for $426,000 of support. 58 to the city of Savage for over $500,000 of support, and 58 to the city of Shakopee for $571,000 of support. So there's been a lot of effort and um, outreach to these businesses. Do I think we've been perfect? No, probably not. Um, and I think we can continue to try to improve that process. But there has been some relief out there, um, and this program would continue now to provide support to those businesses that have been impacted by Executive Order 2099. So with that, a little background, I'm going to turn over to Chris. Yeah, and before, Chris, you, you take off, I mean, Leslie, what you kind of talked about, has it been perfect? No, but we, we were giving nothing that was perfect either, um, trying to do the best we can without harming the citizens of Scott County because part of it when it came out is, hey, here's this money, get it out, but if you do it wrong, we're coming after you. Like, mm -hmm. wait, what? Um, and they've acknowledged that mistake um, upstream. So we have uh, put our best foot forward as quick as we could. And um, while not knowing the rules in which the game was being played, and now we got a new set of rules and a new game, and we're stronger for it, and hopefully we'll be able to roll things out better. Yeah, I think there's a little more flexibility here, and I think the rules were changing. And I will say again that um, the CDA has been a tremendous partner in this. I think Stacy and Joe um, and the nonprofit that we've worked with um, to try to support folks and get those dollars out there. Even in my discussions on the chamber, the Prior Lake Chamber, um, Sandy Fleck, um, executive director, commented on how she has used the first stop shop and could reach out to them at any time to get answers and responses. So they have been a tremendous partner in this. And, um, you know, that's part of the action here moving forward is to continue to work with them. But they've done a nice job. Thanks, Leslie. Thanks for that, for that introduction. And we were, we were trying feverishly actually to get that data to you on a PowerPoint slide while we were out in the hallway. But thank you for reading through those peer trends. That was um, helpful. And I also want to acknowledge we haven't been there All right. Um, so uh, Lisa and I wanted to present just a little bit of information to you about what are some options for you as you look at the state um, allocations for um, business supports that were ordered by the legislature yesterday. So just a quick 
a quick snapshot of where we are in history. So the Executive Order 2099 was signed on November 18th, and um, it had multiple strategies to slow the spread of the COVID-19 virus. And the piece that is most relevant to our conversation today was this four-week dial back of operations for a segment of our business community that was um, either completely closed or partially closed. You'll remember that bars and restaurants, all indoor services were closed. Gyms, fitness clubs, convention centers, sporting venues, um, similar businesses were all closed for a period of four weeks. And that executive order is scheduled to run until December 18th at midnight unless there's additional action by the governor. Um, yesterday, they met in special session. And we had talked on December 3rd about a contingency plan, right? We talked about what could the county do to support local businesses if the state fails to act? Um, you gave us some really good guidance around that. We went forward and started to create a plan. But then yesterday, the state did, in fact, act, and they made two critically important decisions. One was to allocate funding to support businesses and nonprofit organizations. And the other is they made a decision on a model that combined um, some grants being issued by the state, some grants being issued by the county as a way to... Um, expedite payments and allow counties to respond best to local needs. So here's what that state county hybrid model looks like. The Minnesota Department of Revenue um, was appropriated $88 million and they are gonna make direct payments to um, what the governor's order called um, places of public accommodation, bars, restaurants, wineries, those kinds of places, as well as gyms and health clubs, fitness centers. So those allocations will be direct to those businesses. The Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development was allotted $14 million, and they will make direct payments to movie theaters and convention centers. $114 million plus was allocated to Minnesota counties to provide local relief. And again, that was a way to say, you all probably know how to respond best to your local community needs. Um, so counties were given a great deal of flexibility really to establish who's gonna be eligible, how much grants are gonna be, um, as long as we know that we need to spend those funds by March 15th. This is what Scott County's allocation looks like. Um, each county was awarded a per capita allocation that was based on data from the Met Council and the State Demographer's Office. They were then awarded an additional 2.5%, and that money was specific to cover administrative costs, and there is direction from the state that we cannot use state funding in excess of 2.5% for administrative costs. So clear direction that they want this to go directly to the businesses. Um, and so Scott County is receiving a little over $2.9 million in, in that allocation. So one option that you have is to look at this screen and this total and say, I want this all to be issued in a small business support program. Another option for you to think about and that, that we have been sort of interested in talking about over the last few days has been looking at landlords a little differently. When we looked at the CARES Act money, we put them in that housing bucket. And what we're, what we're um, wanting to talk with you about today is do we wanna look at landlords differently? Do we wanna look at them as small business owners who have losses related to this executive order? And if you are interested in looking at them differently, um, we did some calculations about what it might cost to help them out. And based on our experience with the CARES grants, um, we think if you set aside $350,000 of this money and an additional um, $8,750 for administrative costs that we could um, potentially provide two months of funding to landlords who have not received rent payments from their tenants. Now here's the caution in this slide, because all this has been happening so quickly we do not have a firm commitment yet from our community partners that they can do this for 2.5%. So if we were not able to do that, um, we would pull this portion of the proposal and put all of that money into a small business uh, fund. So I'm going to pause there and just see if you have any thoughts about that.
Mr. Chair and Chris, um, would it, you kind of said if this happens on this, would another option be if our community partners could not do it for two and a half percent, but they could do it, you know, for three percent or whatever, because again, we don't, we understand that CAP or whomever, they can't lose money helping us. Yes. Wouldn't it be an option to subsidize administration from our set aside CARES dollars? It would if, if that's what you elected to do, yeah. yes. Um, I, I, and I'll start it in this discussion already because I've already been thinking about it. Um, I think we set aside those dollars. We thought we were going to use a lot of them for this exact purpose, and now we're getting state funding for it. I would like us to have some availability of some of those funds for administration, knowing that administration is staying in the community. I mean, it's helping our, our local folks who are helping administer it and really helping get this money out. So I, I appreciate and like, I think landlords are a small business and that's why we didn't, didn't have the same participation earlier. I like doing this and I think if we need to dip into some of that set aside to make this happen, it makes sense. Just like when we talk about next, the, the small business grants, if we feel, and I know some of us got, I had a call this morning, some of us got an email last night about different audiences we could do better in helping. Um, and again, I think we've done great too, as best we could, but uh, maybe maybe we need to be willing to help get this money out the door and, and get it around the community. So sure. I'll just put that out there. And just for clarification, this component, the landlord piece would go through CAP which is where it was. Yes. So we built a system to administer that CARES money, and that system could just be, like, we could just flip the switch on that. So we have trained people that know the program. We'd recommend using the same criteria. Um, and so it would be a housing link would take the applications, and CAP would do the verifications and processing. And so going back to the screen prior was the, uh, the business side of it with the 2.5% and that component would still go through next stage in the CDA. Correct. And that administration fee is 4% currently? Well, it, as long as we don't, uh, as long as we make reasonable efforts on the documentation, they'll consider doing it for 2.5. Yeah, I would think based on just quantity, that should make sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Chris, maybe then, if I understood what you had said in this discussion, there isn't the same tracking requirements that CARES had. So if it's if it's simpler, they felt they could do it for the 2.5% yes. than the 4% that we had negotiated before. Is that correct? That is correct. That um, uh, They learned some things, like we were talking about earlier. They learned some things about some efficiencies, um, and they also... There is a, a lesser deep dive into these to verify the funding because it's not that federal money. So, and I'm trying to remember if this was, it was either you or Stacy um, talking about some of the, um, you know, and, and retail online sales, they look for abandoned carts, you know, the people bailed out. <laughs> so wasn't there a high number of people that kind of started the process, yes. but then kind of bailed and yes. left the cart empty in this case? Yes. Um, and there was a, a and or but I think and there was a wait list at one point in time. Mm -hmm. um, now this is a new mm -hmm. program, mm -hmm. so everyone could potentially jump back in whether they got money before, whether they were um, on a wait list before, which I know there ended up not being one, or the third party. I don't know why I'm pointing back here, but the group that uh, we're going to bail on this, everyone would be able to and would have to jump back in and do a, a new application because it's, it's, so if anyone's out there thinking, oh, well, I didn't get it last time, I'm just gonna get automatically enrolled in this, they will not. Correct. There's they have no, to re-enroll yes. or reapply, whatever the right yes. term is. And we are, we're asking you to consider a focus on the most recent executive order. That's a decision that, that you will make. But we're suggesting that instead of going way back to March, that yeah. we look at what are the right. businesses yes. and what are the costs since November 18th. Um, everyone would have to reapply again. I think that Next Stage has made some really good suggestions about how to make that process easier, um, uh, reducing some of the back and forth they did with businesses to get documentation. So um, I think that they have... Uh, have some nice improvements that they recommended for the application process, make it easier for people. And now flipping back to the screen that we're looking at on the landlord side, because 
I mean, they, we just redid that or did it, however you want to say it, in the last 30 days. That wouldn't necessarily impact those right. again if they wanted to apply for this. Right. Because we it was would, so close together. It doesn't correct. matter. So we would suggest, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, I'm sorry. Good. Um, good. So we would propose that we, with the landlord program, that we also stay pretty hooked to that um, executive order 2099. Right. So we'd look at December 2020 and January of 2021 because we know that the moratorium, the eviction moratorium, is going to run at least through January. And so looking at those two months, could we fund landlords for unpaid rent? The, the I would thing like to make a comment on it, if I, I might. Uh, there's clearly a need in this category for landlords. We, we sort of changed our effort, I think, in about, I don't know if the window of changing our effort was two weeks long, or it was a very short window where we, we weren't getting uh, renters to apply because there was the moratorium and they, they didn't fear being evicted and so forth. And so we switched our effort to landlords and we had about 500, over $500,000 of need met that came in kind of flooding in as when we changed our efforts. So there is need in this category. So I, I do support uh, making a landlord uh, uh, available to the small business category. The, um, and the administration issue here is we just haven't heard back from CAP. We found out about it, you know, yesterday what the present is when they reached out, we, we don't know yet. So we don't know if they can do it for 2.5 or not. That's right. what we have to right. hear back. Is there any weird um, situation here where landlords potentially are made whole or close to or some percentage thereof, the renter has not paid for two months or 12 months or whatever it is, the landlord's gotten a grant and now they're going after, like is there any sort of? There's nothing, we don't have any legal authority to prevent them from filing an eviction. But what CAP and Housing Link have provided is a statement to the renter as well, saying we have paid your rent on your behalf, so that if there was an eviction action taken, everybody has good documentation. Okay. So this, this kind of leads into then what we would propose for a Scott, what a Scott County local relief program would look like. We would suggest or, or, or support your thinking around um, focusing on businesses that have been impacted by uh, 2099. And I'll, I'll say to you that the state language is different that the state language opened this up to a businesses impacted by any executive order in response to the pandemic. So ours would be a more narrow window. Um, we, would, um, we would like to add it that a business would have to be in compliance with executive order 2099. So if it opened in defiance of the executive order that those businesses would not be eligible. And that also differs for the language in the state bill. Um, they, uh, I was reading some things when we were out in the hall this morning, um, decided that it was uh, administratively too costly and too time consuming to go back and try to hook up which businesses had or had not been in compliance and so they deleted that language. So it's just silent on that issue in the state, um, the state programs. Uh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Um, Chris, would you go back over that last uh, point again about the compliance with 20-99. Yes. Did you say we drop that language or we're going to keep that provision we're, in there? Well, we would propose that you keep it, um, but um, of course you get to, you get to um, choose that. Um, but we have had very small, I think there's only a single business in Scott County so far that the AG's office has interacted with in any kind of serious way. Um, so I don't expect that it's going to be a huge problem. Um, although there are, there's a lot of political energy on this issue right now. So that could change. And it, you know, I, I think that's gonna be a discussion point for us. And I do worry about, it, it seems like it should be simple. Are they in compliance, not in compliance, but, but I'm, not, I'm not sure it's always gonna be that simple. And mm -hmm. I hate to put staff into those positions. So I think, I mean, we, we need to have that here on the shelf to talk about. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, because part yeah, of it is... I'd be interested in further discussion about that point, too. Something's not sounding right about that, about us prohibiting people for basically exercising their constitutional right to protest. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, is it a huge, like, I have not heard, but I might be living under a rock. I'm not, I'm not. I, I think it depends what happens this week. I mean, if, if everything opens Friday at midnight, right. it may be one thing. Yeah. If it's two weeks from Friday at midnight, it's another thing. Wait a minute. So, you said, do you know uh, something we don't know? No, I do not know anything. <laughs> About anything right now. <laughs> <laughs> so. You know, I was just going to say that there is there is a coalition out there that is that of restaurants and entertainment facilities that that are considering all opening in defiance of the executive order at one time. So, based on your guidance, um, we will keep that or we will strike that. Um, Phys having a business physically located in Scott County is a, is a piece that the state and the counties have similar language or same language on. Um, no current tax liens on record with the Secretary of State is a, is a state requirement. Um, one thing that is interesting is that businesses could qualify for funding through the state programs as well as the county programs. So, for example, the state programs require that you demonstrate a 30 percent, at least a 30 percent loss in business. So if you are a business that has suffered losses, but maybe not up to 30%, you would still be eligible to apply to the county program, not the state program. Or maybe you have losses that are greater than what the state is going to um, allocate, and then you could apply for additional funding to cover additional different expenses. So you do want to run these concurrently, basically. The money that we were talking about last week and now that we know the state, um, you know, has their funding coming our way yep. to Main Street's way. Okay. I think they have to to meet the timeline. Well, with our former CARES money or whatever, we, we don't have a timeline on that. Right. Need is the timeline. But this is our new money. Right, our, right, yeah. right, yeah. right. But, no, but, it's not running those concurrently. Okay. We could choose to use some of that for administrative costs. Right, the care, the CARES yep. money, yep. yep. Correct. So you could choose to provide some of those dollars sure. if we saw a need beyond, right? Beyond. Correct. Well, and, and beyond scope and also time, because part where I'm coming from this is I tend to be a saver at heart, so like I want to pull our money back, you know, the city back off the table. Now the city or the states kind of put theirs up. Yep. Yes. Because part of me wonders, uh, you know, we might need that money. Yeah, the both state and county funding is the county funding you're going to receive from the state. Got it. Yep. So um, I'm going to use Joe Blow's restaurant really has $60,000 worth of expenses. So I had quite a long discussion with Senator Pratt. That's where the landlord is coming from. His intent was they were a business. But their intent also was, if you talk to him, which I think is really critical, is the state actually has less dollars than they gave to the counties, and they wanted to do it on that amount to try to get it out there quickly, but they actually wanted the counties to be able then to meet what the real need was. So Joe Blow's restaurant really has $60,000 in expenses, but he's only eligible for 25000 The county could choose then, if the documentation is there for a higher amount, to give them additional funds to support their business. That was very clear in our discussion right. that that was the intent of what he was trying to get at. But would that be a second step in this? this D, if, I, if I'm understanding, and maybe Chris can explain, but DOR is going to send checks to the businesses that were impacted. They will have to apply to the county for the county funds. So the state's going to send theirs out. They yep. will have to apply to the county. We would then review and understand. We're going to get that list from DOR. They receive $25,000. They have $60,000 in expenses. Whatever our cap is, we could give them those additional funds. So we will know in time how much they got from the state. Correct. Okay. That was really important that there was communication in this from the Department of Revenue and Deed to the counties. We need to understand that. Well, that's that's part of where I'm coming from. This at is that, like, yeah, I want to get the money out to Main Street. I mean, it's, um, 
but at the same time, I want to keep some powder dry because I never know what's coming around the corner. Um, so I just want to make sure we've got some of that care is not trying to hoard it, trying to no, save it to preserve the next step. You put that in a fund today for response to the pandemic. So this action right now isn't, this action right now isn't proposing we use any of that. Any of the, that any being of the, the county. The stuff former, that's already in yes. the, the fund, yes. right? Okay. Correct, everyone? That is correct. Right. And I brought up, Yes, maybe we want it a little bit if yeah, we yeah. need it to yep. do that. So that was it, but yep. not most well, of that, it's going to stay there. Yeah, I just wanted to, you know, clarify in this age of very yes. low shelf life, um, right. yeah. and it's very easy for things to get. Wait, I thought you, me, yeah. wait, no, I thought you were, no, I wasn't. Right. I'm changing every day. Right. Every moment again. <laughs> ah, the good old days of spring. Huh? <clears throat> Uh, these are just some more examples. I talked about a couple of these already. There's some other things the county could pay for that, that would go beyond the state. Um, businesses that are indirectly impacted. So maybe you don't own the business, the restaurant that got closed, but maybe you own the business that sharpens their knives or provides their table linens or whatever. That if you could show a reduction in loss in your business, that we could consider those businesses as well. The other thing we'd like you to weigh in on, frankly, is um, we'd like to support what, what I called here community assets. So those things that are operated as nonprofits that might be owned by schools or cities. So for example, community centers or some of our like ice hockey kinds of programs that are run by local nonprofits. And um, so we'd like to look at what your thoughts are about funding those, even though they have those ties to cities or school districts. This was another one that the intent was there, that they, that they wanted to support like Jordan or Shakopee or New Prague, where they lost operating <laughs> revenue for their community centers, those types of things. It's why the wording actually went in to support nonprofits that operate like a business. So just to clarify, you're saying the state's not the state's not going to send those mo any money to those businesses to the knife sharpener right. or those community assets, but they gave us full authority to set criteria that could include those folks. They neither directed us to do it, nor did they prohibit us from doing it. And Les as Leslie yeah. said, she's had great conversations about the intent. Okay. What was the, the intent? The intent was there. Great. I like that. Um, use the funds. What we're proposing is that we um, make grants available up to $15,000 per business. Um, Next Stage and the CDA have proposed some pretty minimal documentation requirements and lots of options. Like you can provide any one of this list of documents to verify your losses or your costs. Um, we would again look at costs that have occurred since uh, Executive Order 2099. And then actually an early version of the Senate bill had some pretty concrete um, examples of things that this money could be used for just to um, sort of put some concreteness to it all. Um, and so they put together a nice list of, of things that funds could be used for. So what we would propose today um, is that you um, amend the budget accepting the state appropriation of $2.9,229,865.31. Um, and with that, we would build a program for businesses and nonprofit support. Um, we'd ask you to uh, um, approve an agreement for us to contract with CDA and Next Stage um, to administer that program. Um, we'd ask you to um, approve an agreement with Housing Link and CAP um, to work with landlords as a small business and provide that support. And then when we pulled uh, Resolution 2022-45 earlier today, mm -hmm. um, that meant that we also withdrew the um, discussion about the um, Chambers of Commerce. And so I wanted to talk just a little bit about that. Um, but our, our recommendation to you is to put that on hold temporarily. Um, the directors of the Chambers of Commerce and Shakopee and Savage have both resigned and are, are taking other positions. Um, and our conversations with Prior Lake have indicated they did not have an immediate financial need. 
And so um, it seemed like a time to pause. And instead of issuing this money, um, that Lisa and I would meet with them and talk about are there some opportunities to regionalize and sort of reassess what the need is after we had a chance to sit down and engage with them in a, in a better way. And so we could then bring it forward later if it was appropriate, but that it would give us a better chance to reexamine what the need actually is. I think personally that makes a lot of sense because things have been changing rapidly. Um, some of the information we did not have at that time, um, yeah. some of that information has changed in a big way. And I think there's an opportunity for uh, a regionalized powerhouse um, that maybe some we could help yes. funding wise. Um, so not that it's like gone, it's just on right. the table until we know what's on top of the table because that, those plates have all changed. Right. And so it, it might be back. Um, but but it would give us time to have a better a better assessment and better engagement with the community about it. I, I'm I'm okay with that. I understand the changes. Um, you know, I I guess I'm most um, familiar with Shakopee situation, and of course they're still up and running and trying to help businesses yeah. and doing things. So my ask, I guess, would be that. You're, you said you might be back. I hope you're back no matter what, even if, if okay. it's that we don't, you know, use some of our funds towards it, because I think we've had some strong support to supporting, you know, maybe maybe those costs needed to regionalize, those types of things. We want chambers to, right. you know, be able to help economic development and business. We, we don't want government to do it. So I hope we're back, and I, I hope we okay. keep it on the close time frame, you, know, you okay. know, in January even talking about this because we've had some communication with Chambers and I think Belle Plains in the same situation. They don't have a staff person right now. So okay. they're, they're trying to do things with, without resources. And um, so I'm okay with it as long as it stays, stays on the the table it stays not, on the radar. It's not like we're going to talk about it this summer or something. Sure, and that you know we brought it forward as a support to to small businesses. Like that's why we brought it forward to begin with, and so um, we can surely um, keep it on the radar and bring it back sooner. Great, thank you. Well, plus with these two, we, we know we're going to see that you know they're not, yeah, they're not going away. Show. Yeah, yeah, they're not going away. So yeah, I, I'm yeah I definitely am not saying no, never get out of here. I'm just like wait a minute, wow, okay. We need to get some of our information, which I, a lot of that came in on Friday and Saturday. Um, yeah, we had the, the first conversation, and I think Lisa's the one that had reached out to most of them, so had learned about what was going on at Savage, and obviously Shakopee's changed just last week that we found about towards the end of the week. We had a very good discussion, or I did, with Prior Lake and Sandy Fuck on Friday afternoon, late in the day, and um, talked about their stability and where they're at. You know, this whole discussion on regionalization and how do they work together, um, they've not had that discussion or been party to that discussion. Um, she didn't say they wouldn't participate, actually expressed an interest and, in, you know, wouldn't mind talking with her board about it. Um, actually saw a great coordination between Savage and Prior Lake, the Common School District. They actually have some businesses from Savage in the Prior Lake. Um, chamber. And so um, she was very comfortable with trying to maybe take a step back and wait and have a bigger discussion um, as well. So I thought it was a good discussion that we had with her. You never heard back from Elko Newmarket, right, was my understanding. And I think New Prague didn't express any, they were down some, but no real issues is my understanding. Yeah, and this, this whole idea of a potential regionalization was, you know, some of the businesses, I think, would support that. So it's not like some idea that we're trying to conjure up. It's, it's, um, so, yeah, okay. So, so is there anything else you would like to see through this work as we start putting this together? Um, I think Next Stage and CDA are ready to get going pretty quickly if you approve this. Um, so if there are other things you'd like to see baked into it, um, we're interested. How quickly is this check coming from the state? You know, I don't know how quickly those checks are coming. I mean, they they said on the news this morning they thought they'd be out by the end of the year. So, um, but, but but we want to get going and and do the um, you know work that needs to be done to get that. I just right. 
that's the whole point. What, right. Why we They're wanted to do right what now. we did. Yeah. yeah. Right. Is, so back though to your list. Let's make sure because we want to adopt these criteria. It's like, oh, you're assigning staff some flexibility. If there were a couple things here, like the way you guys are doing the But you, I think Commissioner Beard raised a concern about compliance with EO 2099. So if you go to the DOR and D1, it really is, and the overarching legislation talks about Executive Order 2099. It gave the counties a little bit more flexibility in that. It doesn't specifically cite it. Um, but then you raised a concern about being compliant with staff are going to have to understand that. And if you have concerns with that or I mean, I, I kind of feel the same way to some extent that if the state doesn't mandate that being a piece of the pie because it's hard and to try to link all that stuff, it's going to be hard for us then too. Just on that, just on that piece alone. Um, like if there's some sort of, I mean, it's saying in compliance with that executive order. Like if there's some, if it was, they were out of compliance with something, some health related thing or some, that's one thing, but it's like, ay, ay, ay. ay. Uh, I say strip it. I think Commissioner Beard wanted to talk about that too. Yes. Maybe. Yep, I mean that now is, yeah. Is he on there? Because I know his uh, battery was running low. Yeah, I'm still here. I'm down to about 70%. <laughs> well, let's use it on this. <laughs> Commissioner Beard, what are your thoughts as you brought this up? What about uh, determining whether or not they're in compliance or have some interaction with the Attorney General yep. about Dash 99? Yep. Yeah, I'm thinking there's a whole can of worms here about due process and evidence and I fair know. trial and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and just uh, the whole business of, about them, the whole reason they're in this pickle and this between a rock and a hard place is because of uh, executive orders that have are debatable in their effectiveness and what's been going on. So, uh, yeah, to exclude them because they had the temerity to stand up and, and, and question the emperor um, strikes me as a, a, <laughs> something I don't want to be part of. I just assume that if they, they're in desperate straits and they want to humble themselves and ask for help, uh, they should be on the list. That's my thinking. Yeah, I, I am. For different reasons. I think we, we have some different reasons up here for thinking that that we don't need to add another another box to be checked for our program, and that's a box that we can take off. All right. Are we comfortable with the $15,000 cap? I probably so. I mean, it's semi-arbitrary. I mean, you get too low, and it's like, what's the point to some extent? Here's my thought, and, and um, I, I think this is all really good, and, and I think wow amazing especially for a government entity it, just in way less than a year we've learned a lot we've made changes we've figured this out by getting this going now i think it gives time where in a month and six weeks there's still money left and we've seen some businesses who they've been hurting but for some reason they didn't qualify mm -hmm. you're going to come back to us just Hopefully. like with the landlord saying so that's why i'd rather this all sounds really really reasonable you guys have talked to folks i'd rather say yeah, let's get going and please, please come back if we need to amend it. And usually we don't do that because we don't like to change the rules while we're driving the car. But I think we've learned that this year we've had to. And in this particular situation, I'm willing to change the rules while I'm driving the car. Because if we learn something, let's do it. I'm not even sure what kind of car I'm in. Yeah, I don't know if it's a car or not. <laughs> it's going down the road. <laughs> but and, and, like she's, let's get going. Yeah. And I do feel strongly about if in the next you know i guess three weeks till our next meeting if there's a need for additional from our pot over here our bucket of money that we're saving for good yep if there's a need for some of it for administration for reaching out to certain groups to helping some business a scott county business who's been truly harmed but for whatever reason doesn't fit here i i really personally want to hear that because i i think that's what that money's for 
and um, should be used for that if we can. If it's a minor amount and we see a need for reach out, we're just going to probably use a few of those dollars and reach out and make sure that we're reaching whatever it is we need to do. But I want to make sure like on that $15,000 cap, because that does say how far these dollars might go, how many people are going to be impacted. The other thing is the nonprofits. So these nonprofits that operate like a business, I heard most of you say you were okay with that. Well, is that the community asset piece? Yeah. Uh, it seems like a lot of those are red already. Community? It would be, again, impacted by Executive Just Order by 2099. This, like so it's going to be for this month that they can document these types of expenses. I have a little heartburn with that one. I mean, how do we... To make sure it was just this most recent time frame, because now everything's been piling on, piling they on, piling on. They have to document. So the Chris have showed to you. They're going to have to document year. it. Yeah. I think the intent was there. I mean, the <coughs> senator actually even hit on it at scale. <laughs> and I'm okay with it because they do operate like businesses. They yes. employ people. It's yep. uh, you know, it's um. It's real, real stuff going on, and I think that is some of what got lost. And I wasn't even thinking of cities or governmental entities. I was thinking of, you know, run-of-the-mill nonprofits that didn't yeah. qualify just because they were a nonprofit, yet they had employees and they offer services, and it's a, a business entity. So I'm in support of that, especially we have this cap. They have to show right. the period of loss just from this order. We're not backing up to all of COVID. It had to be right. just right. this order. Right. Um, so I'm in full support of that. I just think community centers, that's where I'm getting more hung up on that piece of it, which is typically um, city owned and operated, um, which they got their own CARES money as well. That I just see this as more of a business focus, landlord focus. But That's why they put in the nonprofits. That was the intent of that. Yeah, I don't think they got, they're not getting money for this, for this order. Um. And I'm just thinking, okay, and again, it's community centers that I'm, that I'm specifically thinking about, then that's money that's not going to Main Street. I get that, I, you know, there's employees and there's uh, things happening there, um, probably less, certainly. Um, but that's just two of us talking. There's three more. Don't want to make this harder than it needs to be either. Well, one thing I, and I don't know if what everybody's weighed in on this, but I, I haven't yet, but I, I don't like the in compliance with uh, 2099. In other words, to prove it. I mean, you know, I, I mean, prove they're not, prove they are. I mean, it's like, that, that's kind of a slippery slope. Yep. Mm -hmm. And what about the nonprofit and community center piece? Do you want that funding just like everything else, or what's your thoughts there? Uh, I guess I would leave it up to the discretion of, of staff and the process. I, I, I'm, 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 I'm not, I don't have a lot of heartburn on that. All right. I'm seeing nodded heads. Is that... I see. I, I think it's okay. Yeah. All right. I'm not a hill I'm <coughs> on. I don't think there's I'm concerned about the yeah, uh, not that many part. Is there any other, okay. Chris? Oh, Mr. Chairman, you. can you hear me? Yep. We can hear you. Uh, the nonprofit part, if it's like, you know, Save the Whales or Sierra Club or something like that, I'm not interested. But if it's the local uh, animal shelter or, uh, you know, the, uh, who else would be a non local nonprofit that might qualify, like the um, MRSI, uh, I'd be interested in that. Um, those kind of nonprofits. But uh, if they're like social justice or political action committees, uh, not so much. I think they got to be physically located. We had to be physically located here, show that this order impacted, impacted them. So I, I don't think we're going to get into very theoretical type organizations <laughs> like that. They also have to run like Good. a business. They have to show okay. some kind of loss and, and some kind of expense, business expenses. Well, the good news is it's all being siphoned and sieved through you guys. So that gives me... Um, is there one more, Chris, that you needed? No, we needed, um, oh, did you want to, would you like us to use our best judgment on the percent of county dollars we're using for administrative fees? Is that just a reasonableness standard, or would you like to set a number on that? 
I'd like you to see, you know, negotiate the best you can. All right. Okay. Yeah. So we'll do that. We will set the $15,000 limit. We will strike the language about uh, compliance with the executive order. Uh, we will agree to fund those community asset uh, pieces if they qualify. So, and then, I was going to say the last thing is we will work to get out into the community if we have to use a few of our budgeted funds um, to get out there and make sure that we are advertising and people are aware of this in the different mm -hmm. um, maybe areas that we don't necessarily work with so much. So we'll we'll put a few dollars at towards doing that. So procedurally, six point seven is no longer correct. In this, we're going to call six point eight. Just so there's well, it's 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 six point seven, but it's a different resolution that we it's an okay, alternate okay. resolution that we brought forward. Oh, got it, got it. I see on it the changes of the state of Minnesota. All right, I see the two zero two zero dash two four six. Oh, all right. So, Mr. Chair, I'll move to adopt resolution number twenty twenty dash two four six with, and I, I don't know if there are even amendments, but with the guidance yes. we've discussed this morning. Second. Yes. We have a motion and a second on 2020-246 as amended slash edited, whatever. Any um, discussion, further discussion? Hearing none, oh, JJ's ready to go. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. I know. I mean, you guys are getting a lot done in that 9 to 5 work day. Impressive. <laughs> Four days a week, impressive. Unbelievable. I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. I'm kidding uh, for... I think I talked to you, I don't remember what time that was, six or seven. And then yeah, I know you guys were talking after that. So thank you for the hard work. Commissioner Weckham and Brecky? Aye. Commissioner Wolf? Aye. Commissioner Beard? I see a mute. Aye. There you go. Aye. Commissioner Beard? Aye. Commissioner Ulrich? Aye. All right. Thank you very much. We've got another page to turn. Go to beard first before you lose a power. True. You're right. We'll look all the way down to the virtual left to Commissioner Beard. What percentage are you at there? Uh, not much. It's all right. At me here, so. Go ahead. Committee reports. Fire away. Brief, brief update. December 7th, I attended the AMC Board of Directors meeting. On the 9th, I attended the MICA uh, board meeting. And on the 11th, as your representative to the Minnesota County, uh, investment trust, insurance trust uh, meeting, MCIT. Um, let's see, uh, I, I did get a request from a constituent I just wanted to make you all aware of, and we can talk about it in the interim over the next few days. Um, uh, Teresa Coyer died at the, uh, one of our librarians passed away here last week. A citizen called and said we'd like to have a plaque at the, at the library uh, in honor of her, and also asked about flying the flags at half staff which had me going to the governor's office saying, can we just do that? Uh, and because I understand flag protocol is only the president or the governor can order flags at half staff. Well, it turns out for localized events like this, the governor's given permission for county boards to decide if they want to do that. So let me just uh, lay that out there for your consideration. And if um, you want to maybe uh, communicate with Leslie and give her indication whether you want to take it up, uh, we can maybe bring this up in a couple of weeks. But in the meanwhile, um, a plaque has been privately financed uh, commemorating her service to the county and uh, reflecting how uh, fondly we all thought of Teresa uh, over the library. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that's my report. All right. Thank you very much. We'll keep going to the virtual left with uh, Commissioner Ulrich. My left again, of course, you know. <laughs> all right. You, you caught me there for a minute. Um, here's my report. On the 4th, the Scale Executive Committee, the 7th, the uh, STA Legislative Committee. Some interesting things that are going on in STA right now is they're kind of wanting to evaluate if they could be under the uh, oversight or relationship with MnDOT rather than the Met Council. Um, that's one thing. They're also discussing possible mergers with Southwest. I might have reported on that previously. It's a, a sort of a timely possibility. Um, 
because Len Simich, their executive director, will be retiring sometime in the near future, and that's a good time when you have uh, one retiring and don't, when you're talking a merger of that nature. On the 7th, the MBTA Management Committee, the 8th, the CDA, uh, the 9th, the MICA Board Meeting, the 10th, the FISH Monthly Meeting, we, it was a kind of a hope and gratitude theme with uh, sharing of outstanding FISH stories during the year. The 10th, the 169 Corridor Coalition, um, might have reported on this, that uh, we talked about our, our leadership. It'll be uh, Kevin Burkhart and Matt Lehman as Chair and Vice Chair. Uh, we're working on re-engaging the, uh, um, the uh, what do I call it, the 169 Mobility Study. Uh, we're going to re reconvene that group. That was all the way from Scott County up 169 to Highway 55 into Minneapolis. It's a, it was a study for BRT and uh, MinPass, and we're, we're waiting uh, to do that. Potentially, so we can have a face-to-face -face meeting, but we're also waiting. There's a lot of newly elected people along the corridor, so we weren't rushing into this. We weren't going to do a, a meeting before March, and now we may wait, wait till after June. We think that with the vaccine, we could be probably back to widespread face-to-face uh, -face meetings with the immunity from the vaccine. But we, we don't know that. But we're so we're, that's in the future. Eleventh, the scale meeting. I had to jump in at the last minute and lead that. Um, uh, as our chair was, I was not able to attend on a last minute basis. We went through our legislative priorities. Uh, we had a mental health feedback or, or update uh, from Janet Williams <clears throat> on uh, issues there. And um, we sort of were rushed. I, I, some of our legislators gave us a little long commentary on our, our legislative proposals. Not all of it was favorable. Some of it felt like a lecture. Um, I, I wasn't a fan of that. Uh, after that meeting, we had an RTF board meeting, and it was mainly uh, just updates on minor repairs. We also went over the budget, year-to-date financials, and so forth. The 14th, I had a uh, STA a board meeting, and just worked on the, the next contract with uh, Meserling Kramer and transit issues, and uh, some of the stuff I already mentioned about the STA or opt-outs being under uh, MnDOT rather than uh, Met Council. Um, talked a little bit about the um, Blue Ribbon Commission. It was interesting the uh, points that they made about uh, why it wouldn't work to have appointed elected officials. All every point that you could make uh, there would apply to the tab itself. They it, it said you have parochialism; people won't vote uh, right because they would be thinking of their localized interests. Well, that'd be true of every tab elected official uh, member and. And then they also uh, had one about um, being both the governor, regulator and the um, regulated, uh, that the, that would be a situation if there was appointed elect, elected uh, officials. And I said, well, that sounds a lot like uh, the Met Council and Metro Transit, uh, the situation right now. So their arguments were, were pretty weak. Actually, the arguments we heard long ago from Judge Shetland and so forth. So it was felt like um, a report that was somewhat pre-written, at least in, in regard to some of those points. Those have been known. There's nothing new there. Uh, the 14th uh, meeting with Greater MSP, they're talking about uh, leadership strategy on racial equity, and they feel that they do have a role, and they should clarify their role, and they need to be a little more public and assertive in, in working on racial equity in, in terms of uh, economic development and opportunity in our region. We do still have a big blight um, in our region, in our country, and probably the world, of what's happened with all the events in Minneapolis of the, the racial event, you know, the murder, the, the response, the lack of police response, and, and then defund the police, and, and all the negative stuff. We, so we have to figure out how to overcome that, change some of that narrative, change some of what's going on there. I, I don't know how much role a greater MSP has, but there still is a mess to, mess to work on in regard to all that went on there. Um, so that's the end of my report. Thank all you. right. Thank you very much. Commissioner Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. On the first, uh, New Market Township had their monthly meeting. On the third, the Million River Joint Powers budget. Uh, that evening, the, uh, in addition to the uh, um, 
Dutch Tech. How many meetings in uh, Elko the market and there? Not the meeting. On the fourth, uh, the Workforce Investment Board had their uh, awards uh, deal. It was all on Skype. Uh, at 35, uh, I'm on a committee to find uh, the chair, vice chair, and uh, treasurer for next year. And so we're uh, looking for that. And then on the seventh, uh, helped uh, with the Lions. I, I am a Lions member, and uh, um, at the VFW, we had, um, made 200 lunches and gave them out to seniors for free. Um, we do it every year. Normally it's a sit down dinner, but this year it was a drive through and uh, worked out pretty good. That evening, Prior Lake, Credit River, and Cedar Lake had their meetings. On the 9th, the uh, MESB met, um, just had their finals and their year and stuffs and budgeting. On the 10th, uh, Prior Lake uh, City, we met uh, with the administrator, went over a couple of topics there that they're talking about. Uh, um, and then after that, Spring Lake Township, they're talking uh, about some uh, big issue was uh, docks and you know how many boats they can put out on some of that. So there's going to be a meeting this uh, Thursday on the 17th at 7 o'clock. They're going to talk a little more about that. On the 11th scale, which everyone uh, which we've talked about. And then last night, uh, planning and zoning. I was on, but I couldn't hear much. I could watch it a little bit, but uh, there was an audio difficulty. Um, the big issue on there was a... Uh, um, uh, development in Sand Creek Township, and uh, um, I think it tied three to three. So. Mm. We'll be seeing it. So we'll, <laughs> so we'll be seeing that, and uh, uh, thank God this is in Barb's district. So. Uh oh, They're always down there, yeah. aren't they? So, they, well, unless it's a helicopter or something. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, that is my report. All thank right. you. Thank you very much. Looking down to my right. All right, thank you. Um, Oh yeah, I know. We'll, we'll all get there. We'll... Oh, all right. They can control in there. Thank too. you. Um, so last, uh, our last board meeting was actually on December third. So um, and that afternoon, I guess for all of us, we had our community health board meeting and then our truth and taxation, even though we call it something else now, meeting. Right. Um, both went well. On uh, December 4th, we did have the Dakota Scott um, Workforce Development Board Legislative and Employer Awards Ceremony online, as Commissioner Wolf said. Uh, just one, one thing I'll point out, that the uh, award winner in the youth category for Scott County was um, Shakopee High School with their work with academies and preparing kids for the workforce, you know, either right out of school, for college, whatever. So that was nice, and several representatives from Shakopee High School were on the program and, and told others about the work they're doing there. Uh, December 7th in the afternoon, I uh, attended the first annual, or the first virtual AMC annual conference. Um, David Horsager was the speaker. Um, did pretty well, you know, as far as virtual conference, it, it went pretty well. A lot of um, our friends from around the state there, and they made it a short conference, you know, usually that's a two-day conference. So um, it worked, but I think everybody will be glad to meet in person again and be able to really share some ideas next year. On December 8th, I had a meeting with um, Jake, our library director, to discuss MELSA and strategy and kind of uh, future plans as, as that organization is going to do some strategic planning soon. I think it's an opportunity for us to... Um, talk more about county needs and, and make sure that MELSA is providing uh, services that are important to Scott County and, and uh, make sure as much of the dollars that come from the state to MELSA get back to the actual operation of libraries and services to citizens. Also on December 8th, I had my monthly meeting with Leslie. Um, and de December 8th in the evening had the second night of the Weekend Initiatives Community Advisory Night. Again, all virtual, but it was, um, they did a really good job because there were, you know, staff people and nonprofit folks and then general citizens all talking about, you know, children and protection of children. And they did a great job having breakout rooms where everybody had to interact and share ideas. So, um, again, some good progress. December 10th, I did um, attend the FISH monthly meeting that Commissioner Ulrich talked about. And... Um, I almost didn't attend because I'm like, oh, gratitude, I'm grateful, all happy, great. But it was a really, really good meeting because the stories that reinforced the good that Fish is doing and the connections it make, was making, it, it impacted me, kind of reinvigorated me 
um, to talk to people about fish and, and make sure that we continue utilizing that resource and supporting that, that resource. Um, also on December 10th had Justice Steering Committee where we spent much of the time on the recidivism report from Molly Bremer. And, uh, you know, we, we heard about that a few meetings back and I think that needs to be a big deal because we spent an awful, awful lot of money on um, jail, court, community corrections, probation, and talking about the levy. If we look at what percentage of the levy is spent on those things, we need to change something because it can't be just every year growth equals more people in those systems or we're going to be taxed, taxed out of our homes. So we need to change the dial and figure out what needs to be done to keep people from, from reoffending. We're trying to lock them up and give them fines and do all these things, yet they're still doing these things. What, what needs to happen? Um, I, I think we, we really got to spend more time on that, again, for humanity and people, but for, for our county's budget. That's, a, that's the biggest deal in our county's budget. Mm -hmm. December 11th scale meeting, um, I got kicked off like halfway through, so I didn't hear the uh, reactions of our legislators. I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about that after Commissioner Albrecht's comments, uh, but I had technical difficulty second half and couldn't get back on. Um, also on December 11th, had the state um, statewide community health advisory council, the SHAC meeting. Uh, Commissioner Malcolm was there. Um, some changes in leadership in that statewide organization. So a lot of um, appreciation to retired folks, uh, people retiring. And then Sheila Cascaden of Olmstead County was um, elected the new chair of that group. That yesterday, last night, came to most of planning commission meeting and uh, had some community members here, and and uh, that was that was good. And this morning, had my monthly meeting with our health and human services director Pam Selvig. Um, and then one comment I just want to throw out uh, a, a super extra thanks to our staff in public health. They have really had to pivot, work so hard this year, figure out how to support our communities with COVID. But you know what? They're really looking to the future because they know that from a public health standpoint, there's been a lot of other um, <clears throat> impacts to our citizens, whether it be with mental health, um, with, with disabilities and, and getting resources for that. And they're looking to the future. They're not just, they're working hard on how are we going to get the vaccines out, but they're looking to how are we going to mitigate the damages from this year um, to public health? And so I just want to say thank you and um, keep up the good luck work and we're lucky to have you. And in my report. Thank you very much. Uh, on the third, uh, also health board workshop and I wrote down TNT. I don't know what the, we, we call it yeah. now, but it was a public meeting where people could come and comment on the budget and levy process, which they always can get a hold of us, but that's just another opportunity folks can come and learn about how these numbers come to be. Uh, on the 8th, um, I was on for part of, I think, I don't know if it was WebEx, I don't know, technical difficulty. I got for about 40 minutes of the Prior Lake Spring Lake Watershed meeting, but um, I think I mentioned last month uh, at their meeting, Diane Lynch was going to retire. Well, now the time has come where she has retired, so I believe Maggie is interim there now. Um, but, you know, trying to dial all that in and, um, I think they're also looking at a 0% levy uh, again this year. Uh, the 10th Prior Lake Quarterly, I, I, I missed the, the one fish meeting I missed, mm -hmm. and I missed the hope and gratitude. I don't know, does that say anything? I'm not sure. But um, yeah, Prior Lake Quarterly later, later that evening. Um, it's always good to keep in touch with our, our fellow jurisdictions and, and friends and neighbors. Um, the 11th scale. And then after scale, um, you know, this is when the chamber thing kind of started to kind of bubble up. So I did some uh, phone calling and research on that matter. Um, that's not why I changed, but I just, I got more information on that particular topic. Um, and that completes my report. Looking to item number eight, County Administrator Vermillion, an update. We didn't have a, a COVID report today because we had it at the last meeting. Um, but Lisa did want me to mention that the Pfizer vaccine is being delivered this week. Um, they anticipate Moderna's vaccine will be authorized um, on Thursday. Um, we had 10,243 um, cases as of yesterday. 
But also she notes that um, it is declining our daily reports in Scott County. So the surveillance report um, came out. We kind of hit this peak between about November 20th and it looks like maybe December 1st, 2nd. And we actually have been declining now um, over the past um, week or so through the, the 10th of December. So that, that's positive news for the community, you know, masking up, staying apart, washing hands, all those things that, that Lisa um, talks about. The uh, other thing that I wanted to mention is that the county facilities, they will be closed on um, December 24th, December 25th, and January 1st. Those are um, our holidays. The court building, though, will be open on December 24th, so they operate a little bit differently um, than the government center itself. And other than that, that's the end of my report, Mr. Chairman. All right. And I would look to my right, but uh, County Attorney, uh, we went a little long. He was here for most of the meeting and sent me a note that there was no need to meet. So that's good. Um, so now we're looking at item number 10, adjournment. Mr. Chair, a motion to adjourn. A motion. Uh, I think that was a second. Second from Barry. Yeah. Okay. You hear me? Was that a second? Yeah. Yeah. Heard yeah. We got a second. Uh, before we go into any, this is the last. This is the last official board meeting of the year. This mm -hmm. is the last meeting of the year. So I've been waiting so long to have that ornament. So Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays to everybody. And I guess we'll see you next year. So we got a motion. We got a second. Any discussion? No discussion. Roll call, please. Commissioner Wickman Brecky. Aye. Commissioner Wolf. Aye. Commissioner Beard. Aye. Commissioner Beer? Aye. Commissioner Ulrich? Aye. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.